people far on the homestand. So as George Springer said, you need urgency but not panic. It's a long season. What has to change for this team to get back to its winning ways? I think they have to just trust themselves a little bit more than they have recently. I think everybody's trying to feel the pressure of, oh, I got to come up with a big hit. They were 18 and 10 before May 1st, and then the schedule got a little tougher, and we knew it was going to get tougher. We all looked at this homestand thinking, wow, this is a tough homestand. Well, it's turned out to be a very tough homestand. John Snyder understands that most players in this lineup have a track record. One thing you have to remember is we have three new players in the lineup. Belt. Varsho and Kiermaier and it takes a while for everybody to become a team this club's only played 45 games most general managers use 60 games as a benchmark to get a real good feel for what that season's team is all about I think we got 15 more games to really get a feel for this team one thing that has been consistent the five starters have been fairly good outside of Manoa and we expect him to get things turned around yeah it needs to happen and it needs to happen soon and again a couple of things different today Jamie as you uh, you guys have already discussed Danny Jansen behind the plate with Alec Manoa for the first time this year Brandon Belt up Dalton Varsho down in the lineup you got to try something sometimes just to shake it up a little bit we'll see if the Blue Jays can get a win today against a very impressive group of Baltimore Orioles. It half open right now as it has gotten a lot nicer. Alec Manoa's on the mound, Dan Schulman, Buck Martinez, Arden Swelling. Glad you're along with us for the middle game of threes. The Blue Jays look to bounce back from a 6 to 2 loss to the Orioles last night in the series opener. And again, Alec Manoa pitching to Danny Jansen for the first time this year against a Baltimore team that is scoring some runs. They've scored 20 more runs than the Blue Jays have in the same number of games. And of course Ryan Mountcastle is doing Ryan Mountcastle things when he plays against the Blue Jays. A three run homer last night. 15 home runs in 43 career games against Blue Jay pitching. Alec Manoa and company will be looking to reverse that trend. Now Manoa has pitched well against the Orioles in the past. This will be his ninth career start against Baltimore. He is three and one with a very good ERA his numbers of course they're down from a year ago and he has had his issues what they've done is they've tried to get him all the way back on the first base side of the rubber so he can have a better shot at throwing that slider to the glove side strike zone but it has all been about his fastball location he's not located his fastball and that doesn't allow you to set up your changeup and your slider and his slider has not been good this year. It's been getting hit hard, and he wants to improve upon that. He's working hard to do it. He has given up a 333 batting average on non fastball pitches, slider and changeup. So he's been hit around, but you get good location and good pitches with your fastball, it sets everything else up. Good energy in the ballpark here this afternoon as Manoa's on top of the mound. That baseball taken out of play for some reason and now Cedric Mullins will step in for the Orioles hitting 264 got a little power got a lot of speed and interesting with the the time this game is starting Buck and with the way they've got the roof partially open today we got shadows right off the bat yeah and they're going to be consistent the only thing that's going to adjust is the sun's going to move so that shadow line will change a little bit but they're going to keep the roof where it is. 2 and 0 oh, and imperative obviously that Manoa is able to throw strikes he walked a career high seven in his last start that was in four plus innings against the Yankees. And 3 and 0. Oh. To me it looks like he's really feeling for the strike zone now and I, I think he's just got to get over that shoot for the middle of the plate and let the ball do its thing. You can't try to be perfect when you're struggling with your command. Just got to be aggressive. Oh. First strike oh, of the yeah. afternoon. Yep. Now, if I'm Danny Jansen, I'm calling a fastball sitting right in the middle of the plate. I, I can't ask him to hit corners when he's having trouble and throw strikes. Oh. And got another call, three and two. Mullins was on his way down to first. And has a question for Dan Iasonia, who's the crew chief and the home plate umpire today. 
Yeah, and what Mullins did, I'm sure he's very diplomatic. He said, oh, that's as far out as that strike will be, right, Mr. Umpire? <laughs> Brandon Hyde, no doubt, taking note of that in the early going. Boy, a two-seamer in a really good spot near the inside corner as Manoa strikes him out. You know, baseball is such a fine line between failure and success. He gets a call on the 3-0 fastball, another on the 3-1 fastball, and then comes back and makes the best pitch in the at-bat to strike out Mullins. I mean, he was inches away from having a leadoff walk, and he comes all the way back and strikes him out. Of course, Mullins doesn't think he... Should have had that pitch called a strike. Now Adley Rutschman, second year catcher, came up a year ago tomorrow to make his major league debut. Had a very good rookie season and is an even better player so far this year. He's got more walks than strikeouts, and maybe even more impressively, because he's a switch hitter, he's got more walks than strikeouts from both sides of the plate. An extremely patient hitter, one of the lowest swing rates in baseball. Very good defensive player as well. You know, emblematic of what a first overall pick should be. And now he's a leader, too. You know, he was a, a leader as an amateur. He was a leader in college. He has been a leader as soon as he got to the big leagues. You know, last year he had a biceps injury in spring training. That's the only reason he didn't come up until May 21st. Manoa in front of all in two strikes. And he tried to go after Rutschman the same way that he got Mullins to strike out, but instead of kind of being right in on him, it was a little bit up, and Rutschman fouled it back. Not only the first time Jansen has caught Manoa this year in the regular season, he only started once behind the plate last year when Manoa started. Ironically, it was right here against the Orioles in September. He pitched six innings in that game, and he left with a 2-1 lead. The Orioles would come back and win that game, but Manoa pitched well. And, of course, last September, he was the best pitcher in the league at that time. And, obviously, Danny has caught him in the spring. And before every game when they have the meeting with the starting pitcher that catcher Pete Walker the other catcher is in that meeting so Danny Jansen's been in every Alec Manoa meeting that there's been over the last two yeah, and a half years. you have to be involved I mean you want everybody involved because what happens if your starting catcher gets hurt you want the other catcher to have full information about the game plan on a particular day two balls two strikes on Rutschman. You know, I don't think there's anything about his game plan that needs to be changed. It's just that he's not executing the pitches as effectively as we saw last year. Again, he went looking for that inside corner like he got Mullins with, but he missed high three and two with Anthony Santander waiting on deck. The Orioles 29 and 16. That's the second best record in baseball behind only Tampa Bay. And he walked him. Well, one thing we always talk about with your pitcher on the mound, if he's throwing a lot of strikes, the defense is going to be on their toes. But Manoa has been walking a lot of guys, so that might get the defense back on their heels. Varsho, Kiermaier, and Springer in the outfield. Kiermaier made a terrific throw in the game last night. Chapman, Bichette, Espinal, and Guerrero from third to first. And Danny Jansen, as we mentioned, the first time he's caught Manoa this season. Here's Santander, switch hitter batting from the left side against Manoa. Santander hit a home run last night. He's now homered in two consecutive games. This is his weaker side by over 200 points in OPS. But you look at this top four Mullins, Rutschman, Santander, Mountcastle. Four dangerous hitters. And Manoa stumbles. And that's a balk. So Rutschman will go to second. Yeah, Nate he must have caught his spike or something. Watch his lead foot as I don't know what happened. He just felt something that caused him to come out of his delivery. And indeed, it's a balk that takes the Orioles out of that double play situation. Doesn't look like he's 
injured or concerned about anything health wise. So runner at second with the one out and a one and zero count on Santander. Now back one and one. You know when you think about it this is the tenth start of the season it's the tenth time through the Blue Jays rotation and. You know Alec has thrown 45 innings and given him more hits than innings pitched he's walked 32 coming into this game now 33 and he's just not been right. There have been you know glimpses of it in a couple of his starts Kansas City the first one against the Yankees. But even as competitive a guy as he is, I don't care who you are, your confidence has to take a little bit of a hit when you can't find it. No question about it. You know, you have doubts out there wondering where's this pitch going and what's this guy going to do on this next pitch? You know, I've been in a situation and, you know, where you really struggle. And, and I can honestly say I've been standing on deck with two outs thinking, well, I hope this guy in front of me makes an out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go up there right now. I don't stand a chance. And you know what? You go through those times. You just got to battle through them. Already the 20th pitch of the inning coming up. Rounded down to first. Guerrero's got it, and he'll make the play himself for the second out as Rutschman comes to third. So that brings up a guy the Blue Jays rarely if ever want to see in the batter's box and that is Ryan Mountcastle and he's a nice player a 737 OPS against the rest of baseball is nothing to sneeze at but Buck he's almost 300 points better in his career against the Blue Jays. Yeah, there's just something about what he sees from Blue Jays pitching and he's always had a lot of success and look at the home runs we mentioned 15 home runs in 43 games. Including a three run home run off Yusei Kikuchi last night. Tom Castle has hit two home runs against Manoa. He's five for 18 against Alec. That's outside. It's 2 0. The Orioles eighth in the majors in runs per game and again the top four are doing a lot of the heavy lifting for them. They're in a pretty tough stretch of their schedule as well. But they're playing well at 29 and 16. And Mountcastle thought that was outside so the strike zone's been a little wide both ways here in the top of the first uh, outside to the lefty and outside to the righty it's two and one. Okay. The pitchers will love that and as long as it's consistent against both teams you know, I don't think anybody's going to beef. Grounded out to short to his left Bichette and the stretch by Vladdy they get him and Manoa does not give anything up here in the top of the first. Hoping to get off to a, a quick start here this afternoon against the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is back at first base. That's good news. His knee is feeling good. That's good news. And he has had a lot of success in his career against Baltimore, although a ton of that came back in 2021 when the Orioles were historically bad. He hit 12 home runs in 19 games against the Orioles two years ago. Is today the day Vladdy hits his first home home run of this season. They are taking on a hard thrower and a young guy. The numbers don't show it, but considered to be one of the top prospects in all of baseball. Yeah, he's got a great fastball. He's got a 96 mile an hour average fastball, but the problem is he can't locate it, and these hitters they tee off on fastballs when it's over the heart of the plate. Grayson Rodriguez's first pitch is low, ball one. Springer it feels bit by bit starting to come around at two hits last night he's hitting 281 on the homestand 228 overall and he used the word confidence in his pregame interview with Arden Swelling and George is 33 years old I mean he's been around a long time and had a ton of success but 
you know you get in a rut like Manoa has been in or Springer and some of the other hitters are in now and again uh, George talked about just try to have a good at bat make some good contact and build a little confidence from there. Two. It's a very difficult game and even if you have success you have doubts about well, is this when I'm starting to decline is this when my career is coming toward the end of my road and it's Ooh. a very humbling game and a very hard game to play. So yeah you have a lot of doubts and you know what that's why so many teams have introduced mental strength coaches. And they come in to talk to guys when they have some concerns and doubts. A lot of moving on this pitch, and Springer's lucky he didn't get his hand in front of that. That hit the bat, and, and he, he draws his hands in and keeps his hands out of harm's way. And he told the dugout right away, "Don't have a look at that. It hit the bat. Don't challenge that." Look at that changeup. Nasty movement there to get him swinging. Now Rodriguez, he's got a big arm, obviously. And he had a pretty good changeup. His changeup will be 83 miles an hour. That's a circle change grip, and they call it a circle change because you link your thumb and index finger together, and it creates a circle on the side of the baseball, and it imparts an awful lot of side spin. Ground ball to the right side, and it goes off the glove of Adam Frazier, so Bo Bichette is going to reach. Yeah, that should be an error, and I think Frazier would tell you that. He kind of casually went after it. He didn't really go hard after it. He thought he was going to make an easy play of it, but it kicks out of his glove. I would give him an air on this play. Bo, as he always does, hits the ball to the right side. But Frazier may have gotten tripped by the edge of the dirt and turf coming together, but you see it just kicked off the heel of his glove, and indeed it is an air. So now Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Vladdy hitting 311 to fourth in the league. He was out for probably over 10 minutes today doing some drills. They wanted to check the knee out to make sure he was okay to play first base, doing all the plays uh, that a first baseman does. And he and Jose Ministral came off the field, walked by John Schneider, and gave the skipper a thumbs up. Well, Vladdy needs to get it going. You mentioned 311, and that sounds really good, but that's not Vladdy Guerrero. He has hit well against the fastball, obviously. He's always been a good heater hitter, but he needs to drive the ball. He needs to be a guy that is going to drive in a bunch of runs. That's always been his M.O. Yeah, it hasn't been as loud of a 311 as, as you associate with Guerrero. He hasn't hit a home run here. Yeah. He hasn't had a home run at his home ballpark. The count in his favor, 2-0. Good teams have a lead dog, and some teams have two good lead dogs, and the Blue Jays have to pair, in my mind, in Bichette and Guerrero. And yeah, they're going through a tough stretch right now. They are seven and ten in May. They were eighteen and ten before May first. So when they go through a tough stretch, everybody's going, "What's wrong with the Jays?" Well, it's baseball, and it's a six-month season. And yeah, you don't want to lose these games in May. But if this were September, then I'd be concerned. You can always go back, even on very good teams, and find stretches like this. It's just in the moment, it feels like it's never going to change. Well, and again. you know what? Right. Maybe we're at fault because we said, boy, this 10 game homestand is a big homestand. <laughs> <laughs> well, as much as it feels like it's worse than that, they're four and four. Yeah. They're not. They're not one and seven. But they'd like to be more than that, obviously. And they haven't been swinging the bats well recently. Bo's running, and Vladdy lines one to center, and it is caught. Bichette has to scamper back, and he gets in there as Vladdy hit it right on the screws. But a great catch by Cedric Mullins. I tell you what. This is a tough division, but this division has some tremendous center fielders in it. This is another changeup from Rodriguez, and Vladdy hits it on the line, and it's sinking quickly. But watch the break of Mullins in center field. We always tell you this is the toughest play for a center fielder. That ball hit right on, but he makes a diving catch. We saw Harrison Bader do that for the Yankees. We've seen Kevin Kiermaier play great in center. 
This division's got a lot of good center fielders. And another good look, and the Orioles say that this guy is playing as good of center field as he ever has. So two down to the batter is Brandon Bell up in the cleanup spot today. And this is another change for the Blue Jays today as Belt has moved up and our show has moved down. And where is it at the beginning of the year you know Brandon Bell got off to a very slow start. He is swinging the bat very well right now. Dalton Varsho is one of the hitters currently struggling so you can understand why there's a switch. And actually if you go back to some spring training games when Belt started to play and you look at the lineups Belt was like hitting fourth or fifth and Varsho was hitting sixth or seventh. It, this was kind of the original plan although John Schneider said they're basically interchangeable so maybe whoever's hotter hits higher. Yeah I think that's exactly the case and right now Brandon Belt swinging the bat well so you put him up there. How about this pitching matchup. Grayson Rodriguez against Brandon Bell both of them from Nacogdoches right. Texas. I don't know much but I think ratings are very high right now in Nacogdoches, Nacogdoches Texas population thirty two thousand. Two and two on belt hitting two fifty five on the season last fifteen games he's his on base percentage is five thirty three on twenty four times in forty five plate appearances and a full count here which will give Bichette a running start. Matt Chapman hoping for an A.B. here in the bottom of the first. There goes Bo. And a swing and a miss at a 97 mile an hour fastball to end the inning. No score through one. A different look behind the plate with Danny Jansen catching him today. Now Manoa has thrown over 240 innings since the beginning of 2022. Alejandro Kirk, he's caught all but six of them so a very unfamiliar experience for Manoa today and look I wish I could tell you that there is a very sophisticated reason that the Blue Jays made this switch that has something to do with Manoa's approach angle or the way the day Jansen sets up or the pitch calling it's really none of that it's going to be the same game plan same pitch recommendations on Danny Jansen's wrist this is just a switch that the Blue Jays coaching staff has been discussing for a couple of weeks and decided it was finally time to make when Manoa walked a career high seven against the New York Yankees his last time out guys we can really overcomplicate this game at times with a switch like this it's as simple as just throwing something at the wall and seeing if it sticks yeah, it's kind of the pitcher catcher version of changing up the batting order really Arden. thank you very much Adam Frazier leads off the second lines one to right field and it's past Springer He'll have to run it down on the track. Frazier around second on his way to third. And in there ahead of the throw. Now that's a do or die play. We saw Cedric Mullins dive and make a catch on the line drive by Guerrero and Springer. In right field, you know that that ball's sinking and you make a judgment. The issue is do you make this judgment on the first batter of an inning? And he dove for it and just went under his glove and Frazier's going to end up at third base with a leadoff triple. I mean it's a split second decision for Springer. Do I play it on a hop and concede a leadoff single or I try to make the catch and know that if it gets by me it's going to be two probably three. So it goes as a triple for Frazier. Here's Gunnar Henderson. The young third baseman for the Orioles. The numbers don't show it with what he's done this year but another guy considered to be one of the top young players in the game he does have power he will take a walk you can see he's only hitting 195 but he is definitely a big part of the Baltimore future. With Rutschman Henderson Grayson Rodriguez Jackson Holiday down at high A and many others the the Orioles are good and young and. They're going to get better it looks like in the next couple of years there's another wave coming. Part of that is they were so bad for a few years they had you know the first overall pick three times and.
but it also looks like they have done a nice job in their drafting and developing because they've got a lot of talented young guys. Anderson's 21 years old and he's a natural shortstop and they have so many good young prospects that are getting a chance to play. Infield is in for the Blue Jays. They're going to try to cut down the run at the plate if they can. Anderson actually put up better numbers last year in his first into the big leagues than this year. Last year he hit 259, had an OPS of 788. You can see this year the strikeout rate is up, the batting average is down, but it's still just 40 games this year, a small sample for a guy with his talent. Well, last year when you have a rookie come up and he's 20 years old, the league's going to throw him a lot of fastballs. And now they're scouting him, making pitches on him. And he got him swinging up at the top of the zone, one down. Yeah, this is all about adjustments for young hitters when you come into the league. You can catch the league off guard, but they're going to make an adjustment. And this fastball right at the top of the zone, you can see he's underneath it by about two inches. Just never got on top of that fastball. It's a big strikeout from Manoa, first of the inning. And Manoa's been throwing that fastball a lot so far today between the four seamer and the two seamer. There's one lined into right past a diving Guerrero. Ryan O'Hearn, the Orioles DH, drives in Adam Frazier with the first run of the afternoon. Yeah, O'Hearn got a first pitch breaking ball and pulled it past Guerrero. Very difficult to pitch around the leadoff triple. And you can see the slider, his hands on the side of it. It's going to break into the left handed hitter. And he's got too much to the plate. He tried to throw that to a hitter's back foot, and that one was out of the heart of the plate. Rip past Guerrero. So one nothing Orioles here in the second and here's Taryn Vavra. Left handed batter. Corner outfielder not a lot of power good contact guy. You can see he chokes up a little bit on the bat. He came up last year had some really good at bats against the Blue Jays just he reminds me of a guy I bring up every now and again when we're doing games one of your old teammates reminds me of like a Rance Mullenix swing just. Short and clean and puts the bat on the ball. Yeah, he, he understands who he is as a hitter. He hasn't played an awful lot. He's been in 19 games before this one for his career 254, but he's only eight for 33. Only had 33 at bats coming into this game today. Strike. It's one and two. So if you're a pitcher on either side right now, uh, you're feeling pretty good about things. The uh, the edges have been going the pitcher's way. Guerrero playing off the bag, just in front of the runner O'Hearn, who draws a throw. Slider down and in. Better location, Buck, than maybe the one that was hit into right field, but no chase. Yeah, and the one that was hit in right field was just a little bit too much of the plate. But you can see this year not throwing the slider as effectively as he did last year. 28% strikeout rate with that slider. But you know what? A pitcher's success is determined by how he sequences his pitches, and, and all of the pitches work together. I mean, the you got to set it up with a changeup and a fastball before it's most effective. They had him. Brian Mano, we talk about his mechanic. He's aware that his delivery isn't where it was last year, and he's a little rotational. That front shoulder flying out a little bit, and that'll create his back shoulder and his hand to drop and get underneath the baseball a little bit too much. Timeout call by Vavra. And, and for Alec, I mean, he came up and was 
pretty much a sensation even right off the bat in his rookie season. He had had three dominant starts at AAA the year before. He was at the alt site. He has not struggled at the any professional level like he's experienced so far this year. Yeah. And you look at his numbers and suggest that for his career he's put up good numbers. And you always talk to coaches and they'll say you know what we almost like to have guys go through a, a struggle struggling period down in the minors like let them and I'm not saying he's not handling adversity well but you don't let them have that first bout of adversity in the minors that better equips them to deal with it up in the major leagues. Right. And the first bout is a good phrase because he's going to have it right. up here in the big leagues too. Yeah. Well like you said. I don't care who you are. Yeah. This is a hard sport. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you're a pitcher or a hitter. And that's what Vavra can do. He can he can foul off some pitches and extended bats and Manoa's getting near 40 already. to Guerrero he'll get the lead runner and Bichette right back to him for the double play exactly what Alec Manoa and the Blue Jays needed nobody throws better than Brady Guerrero as a first baseman watch where this throw is at second right in the glove of Bichette who waits on it to return throw in plenty of time what a nice double play. Download the Bet365 app and check out the latest odds for today's baseball games. 1 0 Orioles as we move to the bottom of the second. Here at Rogers Center, Dan Schulman, Buck Martinez, Arden Zwelling, and Matt Chapman leading it off. Chapman, another one of the Blue Jay hitters who's struggling right now. He was the American League Player of the Month in April, as you know. But he's hitting just 182 with one RBI in the month of May. What do you see that has changed for him? I think everybody has really focused on him because he was so hot early in the month and they're making good pitches on him. He's not really been able to handle that high pitch, the high fastball. And they've been really pounding him inside. He's really hit well against off speed pitches. Well he missed one right there. He'd like to have another whack at that one. A high slider. But you know what? When you create so much attention on yourself, everybody's gonna go, what's, what's Matt Chapman right. doing is different this year? Yeah. And they start studying you and making new game plans and approaches. Constant adjustments. They want that ball inside. He missed all the way across the plate. But you know what? When you're scuffling a little bit. You have a tendency to, to chase borderline pitches and you think oh, well, I see that next fastball I'm going to hit it it might be a ball. And he got him with a pitch on the outside corner one down. Well we talk about consistency Manoa got a couple of outside balls called strikes early in the game and now that looked like it might have been off the plate away and it's called the strike Chapman has called out on a borderline fastball. So one down for Danny Jansen hitting in the sixth spot. And two for four with an RBI in last night's game. Another thing that John Schneider mentioned when he was asked before the game about Jansen catching, he said Danny's swinging the bat better right now. He's swinging the bat well. And for a team that hasn't scored very many runs recently, you got to put every hot bat in there you can find. The, the Jays have scored 33 runs in their last 10 games. Again, that is not. Terrible, but 3.3 runs per game is certainly below where they would like to be by a, by a pretty decent margin. They've only hit seven home runs in the 10 game. Right, and Kirk's hitting 132 in the month of May. Yeah. And when you look at the runs per game between April and May, it's not that much different. 452 in April, 435 in May. But you know, you're playing better teams. And runs are tougher to come by. So this is a test, no question about it. Fly ball to left center. 
Mullins is there in plenty of time. Two down. So here are the numbers over the last 10 games batting average on base slugging and runs per game all of those near the bottom in the majors this started with the two game series in Philadelphia it's the last 10 games and when you don't hit much and the pitching has been good by and large but it's still hard to win more than you lose when you're hitting like this. Yeah and you look at the, the Philadelphia series and they lost two there one was a walk off loss then the. Beat the Braves three in a row, lost three or four to New York, and then lost the first game last night to the Orioles. But it's a good team. They have a good lineup. They're just struggling at this point. And you know what? That happens when you have two or three guys going through tough stretches. And Dalton Varsho going through a tough stretch right now, down to 212 on the season, hitting seventh in the lineup today. John Schneider talked about maybe taking a little pressure off Varsho, too, as an added benefit of dropping him down. You know, Belt, a much more experienced guy, swinging the bat better, move him up. To center field, but didn't quite get all of it. And the Blue Jays will go one, two, three here in the bottom of the second. Finished third in Cy Young balloting in the American League. Look at that ERA 224, and obviously a much different story this year. He's had a couple of starts that went very well seven scoreless against Kansas City, seven scoreless against the Yankees, but more often than not, too many walks and he'll battle but just can't get that deep into the game has surrendered his fair share of runs and it, it's kind of at the point now the conversation between Dan I Sonia looked like the Orioles dugout I believe the last start was the career high in walks with seven and five runs and four plus innings against the Yankees. And it looks like two innings in he has walked one buck but his command has been a little sharper here today certainly than it was last time. Yeah I mean, even though he started out throwing three balls to start the game he's able to really improve upon his strike throwing ability. I mean obviously if you can't throw strikes you can't compete and it just takes you out of the ballgame takes your defense away from you. Pete Welker's been singing that tune for a long time. You got to throw strikes. One and two, the count on Jorge Mateo, the shortstop and number nine hitter for the Orioles. You know, when we talk about Blue Jays who were hot and now they're struggling, other teams have it too. Mateo hit 347 in April. He's hitting 118 in May. It happens. And he strikes out number three for Manoa. Take on any project with home hardware. Proud partner of the Toronto Blue Jays. Here's how. Game nine of a 10 game homestand for the Blue Jays. They swept Atlanta, lost three of four to the Yankees, lost the opener of this series to Baltimore last night. They good grab. Nice grab down the line. Well done. Uh, they finish up with the Orioles tomorrow and then it's on to the drop to take on the Rays. It's a Tampa Bay Minnesota road trip for the Blue Jays as games against good teams continues. Fly ball well hit right field Springer back and is it in play it looks like it is still in play as it hit off the padding at the top of the fence. I'm sure the Orioles will want to have a look at this but as of now it is a double we had a similar ball in the Yankees series that Aaron Judge hit off the top of the fence in right center main live and in play and the runner is at second base this is a crew chief review to check for a home run to me this looks like it hits on top of the fence and may have hit that metal screen above the fence above the padding we'll get a look at it here the blue padding is the top of the fence. It hits yeah. and hits the back fence. That's yeah. a home run. That's going to be a home run. It skips yeah. off the back fence, and that is a home run right there. That little carom, it went backwards and hit the back fence and then came back onto the field. That's going to be a home run. 
So the judge one was originally well, originally called a double then on the field changed to a home run then after review it wound up a double. This one originally called a double on the field but I'm with you that should be a home run it shouldn't take too long. Uh, so change up from Manoa. Mullen struck out on a high fastball. That's not a bad pitch where it was. It was down and may have been a ball low, but he hits it top of the padding and it bounces back and hits the middle fence above the outfield fence, and that is beyond the field of play. It should be ruled a home run. Initially called a double. And here we go. After review, the ball left the ballpark and hit the railings above the wall. That's a home run. And the way and I saw in your character, it yes. left the ballpark. Yes, it did. <laughs> and anything above the padded yep. wall is a home run. So number seven on the season for Mullins, and that makes it a two to nothing lead for the Orioles. That wasn't a bad location of the changeup, but Mullins was able to get on it. He had struck out on a high fastball in the first inning. And it goes down and golfs this one off the top of the fence in right. Now Adley Rutschman, who walked his first time up. This is the 46th game of the season for the Orioles and it's the 43rd time that Rutschman has been in the starting lineup 33 times as the catcher and 10 times as the designated hitter. So even most of the time Buck he's not in there they want his bat in there and they you know they give him the odd off day here and there I'm sure they use off days very judiciously with him but he's just so good as a hitter they want him in there as much as they can. Yeah, and being a switch hitter makes it easy to give him a lot of at bats. And he wants a lot of his bats. He's always been a guy that plays a ton. He was the first overall pick in 2019. High in the air to left. And still going back yeah, is Varsho. Boy, that took him all the way back to the warning track. Well it's really interesting because now they are moving the roof. They had locked it off uh, behind home plate but because I guess they got a more favorable weather report they are going to continue to close the roof. But as they do that it creates new wind currents because it comes over the top and then swirls and I think that's where that ball carried so far. Parsha thought it was going to be a routine fly ball and took him all the way to the warning track. So two down here is Anthony Santander who grounded out to first his first time up. There's been a lot of turnover on this team in recent years but Santander has been there a while he broke in in 2017 it became a regular in 2019. So he went through the tough years right losing a hundred plus year after year. But he is one of the few guys who has been on both sides of it now playing on what looks like a very good team. Yeah and he's a very good player he provides an awful lot of power he's a good outfielder switch hitter as well. And he can do a lot of things to help the ball club and you're right they have done a nice job of keeping him around as part of the core. Santander now with. Almost five full seasons of service. And that's the pitch right there. Uh, in this case, to a left handed batter. When Manoa's really got the slider going on, they swing over the top of that pitch, but they're taking it a lot this year. Left center, long run, and Kiermeyer is there. But a run for the Orioles and the Mullins home run makes it two to nothing. You can see Buck today looking great as always signing autographs on the pickleball paddles here 
at the ballpark. But everybody wanted to know, well, what does Buck Martinez do on an off night when the Jays are playing, but we're not calling the game? And the answer is, go to the ballpark and check out all of the new social areas in the outfield. And Buck, you made hundreds of new friends last night. You know what? It was really interesting. I had been to those areas, obviously, when there were no games going on. But I wanted, and this was a treat. I love this one. <laughs> I got to see the teeter totter there in Schneider's deck. That's my new screensaver. Yeah, that is pretty cool. But it was really interesting to me to see what a great job they did on those areas and how they have appealed to so many different personalities. I mean, the Corona rooftop patio is like a nightclub. It's like a rooftop bar in the city. Park Social is more of a family area. It's terrific for the families. They have games and swings and everything else. WestJet flight deck, they've improved it behind the first couple of rows. And then, uh, you know, the catch over there and Rogers Landing, it's terrific. And I talked to a lot of fans about their experience and how it has changed. And it was really interesting how many ticket holders were out there. We have our seats here in the 200 level, but we come here first. And you can see it's just a party. I mean, half the people at the Corona rooftop patio aren't really sure there's a game going on. <laughs> <laughs> you may be underestimating that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's wonderful. Yeah. I'll tell you what. And, and everybody was so impressed. And I, and I made a point of asking the people. That was what I wanted to do. What are your impressions of the new renovations? And to a person, they all said, we love it. And it, it's, it's been a tremendous addition to an already good ballpark, but now it's really become a destination. Three and one on Santiago Espinal. I know a lot of people, and a lot of it is, you know, younger folks in their 20s. Like you said, they'll buy tickets, and their buddies have tickets in another section. It's, okay, how about if we meet at the catch in, in the, the fourth, fourth inning, inning and yeah. spend an inning or two, have a drink, and haven't seen you in a long time. You're working, I'm working, and then you go back to your seats. Espinal to left field, and that's going to get over the head of Vavra. And maybe another example that it's carrying to left here, and Espinal's got a double. Yeah, Vavra got fooled on that line drive, and we saw the fly ball that Marshall caught. Look at the bat of Adley Westman, how about that carried all the way to the warning track, and that looked like a routine line drive, and Vavra looks like he's going to cut it off, but then the ball takes off. And he had kind of a shallow route to that baseball and misplayed it. It's over his head off the wall. And Espinal starts things off with a double. First and, hit for the Blue Jays. And here's where the Blue Jays, and they know this, have to do a better job than they've done recently, taking advantage of opportunities. And if you want to boil it down to runners in scoring position, whatever number you want, they have uh, not, not had a lot of success in that area lately. Kevin Kiermeyer's had a lot of success lately, though. Look at the numbers on him. 325, 409 in the month of May. He will pull the ball to first, so he is retired, but Espinal does come to third. Man, Kiermeyer is a very good fastball hitter. He hit that right on the button, but right to the first baseman. But he advances the base runner from second to third, so it's a productive out for Kevin Kiermeyer. And you know what? That's what the players are talking about. Don't try to do too much. Just do what's necessary to help us score runs. And that's a good example of it right there. The Orioles creeping in on the infield. Runner at third, one out. Last four games, the Blue Jays are three for 35 with runners in scoring position. And again, that's not a trend. That doesn't mean it's the way it's going to be, but it's the way it's been recently. And that has cost them a lot offensively over the last few games. And sometimes when you hear about how to get out of that and team meetings and so forth the, the overriding message seems to be don't try to do too much just don't try to get too big John Schneider uses the term stay in the middle of the field. That, that pitch on the outside has been consistently called a strike by Dan Iasonia. Either side, first base side or the third base side. He's got a wide strike zone. Two and two now on Springer. Who will ask for a timeout? to 
first for the second out. Let's go to Arden Zwelling. Well, Dan, you mentioned team meetings tend to happen when teams are going through what the Blue Jays are going through, and they had a hitters-only meeting today, which is a little bit unusual in the middle of a series. That was partly to go over Grayson Rodriguez, but that was also because Blue Jays coaches just wanted to reinforce what this offense does well when it's at its best. To my understanding, that is about halfway through that meeting, the players are the ones who took over and started talking. It was the veterans like George Springer, Matt Chapman, Brandon Belt, talking about some of their experiences when they've been on teams that have been going through similar ruts what to do to get yourself out of it and what not to do i.e. pressing at the plate easier said than done obviously but probably good to have it reinforced in that kind of a set you don't want to have a meeting every day then they don't have any meeting but and this is not a big meeting team but they did have one today just an opportunity to get together and you know kind of Air out what everybody's going through mentally. One and two on Bo Bichette, who reached on an error in the first. So a leadoff double for Espinal. Kiermeyer grounds out. Espinal to third. Springer lines out. And now they're looking for a two out knock from Bichette. And as you can see, he has done very well in these kinds of situations this year. But not here Rodriguez up to 99 and a big yell as he strikes out Bichette and that runner is stranded at third. Turns when Pride Weekend presented by TD hits Rogers Center. Kick off Pride Month with the Blue Jays for a weekend filled with fun and entertainment June 9th and 10th. Visit BlueJays.com slash tickets. That weekend, the Minnesota Twins will be in town. Boy, more good teams. That's a Houston, Minnesota homestand. Blue Jays do have a couple of, quote, easier stretches coming up, but not for a while. 2 nothing, Baltimore, top of the fourth. Ryan Mountcastle grounded out his first time up. In the air down the right field line. Springer and made the catch. Boy, he had, to, he had to put it in an extra gear there right at the tail end of that. Yeah, we've seen a few fly balls in the last inning or so that have been pushed around by the wind. That ball was going away from George, and Dan, you described it perfectly. Watch how he's jogging over, jogging over, and all of a sudden the ball takes off on him. He's got to put on the Jets, but he makes the catch in foul ground. There he says, uh oh. Wins got it. Wins got it. But he stays with it. A slider for a strike to Adam Frazier, who lined one to right. Springer made the diving attempt. It went under his glove to the fence. Frazier with a triple. He had a two run homer in last night's game. And he lines one up the middle. Another guy who's just got the ability to make good, solid contact. He's two for two. Yeah, he's a good little player. And of course, the Blue Jays saw way too much of him last year in the playoffs for Seattle. He had the game winning hit and that comeback win for the Mariners. And he's a low ball hitter. Low and in, low and away. He stays on his fastball and shoots it right back up the middle. So he has tripled and singled in his two plate appearances. And now Gunnar Henderson, who struck out his first time up. Down to third. Chapman the short throw to Bichette and they'll turn the double play. Five six three on the inning ending double play. The second turn by bottom of the fourth. And this is a strange one Buck. I mean he's had a ton of success on the road but not nearly as much here at home. Do you make something of this or is this just a statistical oddity. <laughs> yeah I, I got to think it's just an oddity because you know he's had some good swings here. He just hasn't gotten any balls in the air. For whatever reason, and again, it may just be an oddity or small sample size, the ballpark with the renovations is playing or has played like a pitcher's park so far this year. 
way fewer runs scored in games here than in the Blue Jays games on the road and that's combining for and against last year Vladdy hit 19 home runs here and 13 on the road and his batting average is almost identical home road 273 at home 276 on the road so he had 32 home runs and most of them came right here at Rogers Center. New dimensions of course. And generally closer by the two bullpens as you know the walls kind of go in towards the field but they're higher to try to compensate but I think that didn't the Blue Jays hit five home runs on opening day I believe and, and but it has been the numbers have been low for teams for and against since. I like it. I think it's really added a lot of personality to this ballpark. Yep. You can see that's the bullpen for the Orioles and how it juts out onto the playing surface. A towering fly ball down the left field line. And it will be caught. Who's got it? Vavra? Yeah, Vavra, the left fielder, makes the catch. One down. Oh, Mateo was calling for it all the way. Vavra had a long run because he was so deep. Guarding against Guerrero's power, and Mateo called for it, but right at the end, Vavra called him off, and it's a much easier play for the outfielder coming in. There you see Mateo saying, I got it, I got it, and then he hears Vavra says, No, I'll take it. And it's a much easier play for the outfield coming in than the infielder going out. Now, Brandon Belt, who struck out in his first at bat. Boy, kind of a free and easy 97 to 99 too that we're seeing from Grayson Rodriguez. You can see why, even though the numbers he's put up this year are not good, you can see why they're very high on. That's a cutter right there that missed upstairs, and you know what? I like the fact that they're they're sticking with him. They need starting pitching. Their bullpen is pretty good, and it's going to get better real soon with Michael Givens coming back off the IL and Dylan Tate as well. Those two veterans are very important and they're they're six and seventh inning guys and then they've got Cano and Bautista at the end of the bullpen. They're going to have a terrific bullpen. Brandon Hyde said it's just a matter of days before they activate Michael Givens. Remember last year they were kind of in the hunt at the trade deadline for a wild card spot but they didn't add. They actually traded away Jorge Lopez who was their closer although they got Yanir Cano in that deal and he's turned into a, an unbelievable find for them. But I got to believe if they're in it this year they're going to be buyers. I mean they have a very small payroll one of the lowest in baseball. But if they're playing and I don't know that they'll be playing 650 ball or whatever you know at, at the at the deadline but if they're in it I got to believe they'll go for it a little more this year. Well another thing that is really in their favor is the depth of their minor league system. Right. They got a lot of good players other teams are coveting. Belt aboard. Now, if you look at places like Baseball America or MLB Pipeline, people who do this for a living, both of them have the Orioles ranked with the number one farm system in baseball. Both of them have Baltimore with eight prospects in the top 100 in baseball. And again, a lot of that is they were so bad for a few years, they had a lot of high draft picks, but they obviously did a pretty good job drafting and developing as well. Not unlike what Houston did a few years ago. Chapman sends the ball to right field and it's off the wall belt on his way to third Chapman into second with an opposite field double Well, that ball carried a long way I think Matt thought he had had enough to hit it out of the ballpark but the winds doing tricky things here in this part of the ball game. And this is a four seamer Chapman as we mentioned gets one down and he can get to that one and he drives it to the opposite field comes off the bat like it's going to leave the ballpark and the right fielder sometime there jumps it's off the top of the fence but it's got to be above the blue padding high above that screen fence to go out of the ballpark. So now Danny Jansen with an opportunity to get the Blue Jays on the board. Second and third, one out. Infield is back for the Orioles. They will concede a run to get it out. Back 
to the mound and they got belt hung up. Chapman will get to third. Jansen will get to second. Oh, Chapman. Yeah, he will stay at third. Belt is out. So a good play by Rodriguez. But once he had the ball, the Blue Jays did about as well as he could with that by winding, winding up at second and third. Yeah, Belt did a nice job to keep the rundown going. And this is a terrific play by Rodriguez reaching back over his shoulder to snare that ball. And Belt does a heck of a job of staying in the rundown long enough to allow not only Chapman to go to third, but Danny Jansen to go all the way to second base. And you can see right there, Jansen's moving into scoring position. So the uh, Brandon Hyde has come out and has asked for a conversation for the umpires. I think both Blue Jays were standing on the base and Rutschman put the tag on both of them, which is what you do just to make sure. But you see, yeah, it's the Belt, it's the lead runner and the trail runner, right? Yeah, it's, the it's lead Belt's runner, bag. Yeah. that's his base. Yes. And what they were trying to do is get the faster Chapman on base, yeah. but Brandon Brandon Hyde said, "Wait a minute, Belt, it's Belt's base." It's always belt space and they're going to tag belt but he's safe and Rutschman actually did the right thing he checked tagged Chapman first but the umpire made the wrong call. It's funny it always works out the same both runners stand on the back the catcher ta tags both of them and then everybody looks at the umpires to figure it out but the base belongs to the lead runner so it is belt at third and Jansen at second with two down. And to update the, the stat we gave an inning or so ago, the Blue Jays now 0 for 4 with runners in scoring position. It seems like a lot of them, Buck, have come with less than two outs. You know, right. second and third, one out, bases loaded, no outs. Maybe they get a run in the inning, but they, they have not been able to get that big kind of difference-making hit with a runner or two in scoring position. Dalton Varsho is going to try. Yeah, and here's a guy that really needs a hit. As the discussion goes on, and Chapman had a good at bat his last time up. He got the fastball and hit it off the top of the fence in right. Fouled it back, and it's 0 and 2. with another yell second consecutive inning as he picks up a strikeout to retire the side. Visit to the ballpark buy and manage game tickets redeem offers access exclusive content and much more download the MLB ballpark app today. Now Grayson Rodriguez when he's need a little bit extra on that fastball he has found it and he's picked up some big strikeouts with men on base. This is his fifth strikeout he strands two more base runners and there's a lot of motion on the field and he has thrown 15 pitches in this game 98 miles an hour or harder. So he's got his good fastball and that last at bat against Dalton Barsha he started him off throwing a strike with his changeup on the first pitch. Ryan O'Hearn the D.H. leads it off for the Orioles. He's hitting in the seventh spot had an RBI single back in the second. Alec Manoa had the pitch count up there early but thanks to a double play to end the second and a double play to end the fourth it's pretty manageable right now hitting into the fifth. A ground ball hit right to Espinal at second one down. Another good change up there from Manoa. Now Taryn Vavra the left fielder who grounded into a 3 6 3 double play his first time up. Espinal into right field for a base hit. 
Driver's got a very short swing, and he just puts the bat on the ball. It's just sharply past the second baseman. The run on the two seamer out over the plate, and he's hit the ball sharply a couple of times. The last time, as Dan mentioned, right to the first baseman. So now Mateo, the shortstop, who struck out in his first at bat. Thinking about bunting for a base hit, and he's got a sore right hand, it looks like, because of it right now. Seven of Manoa's 13 outs have come on the ground today, and you like to see that as an encouraging sign, too. Slider for a strike, 0 and 2. Yeah, good reaction for Manoa on that slider because Mateo jumped back. He didn't pick up the spin on it at all. Thought it was a fastball inside and takes a called strike. Watch the hitter's reaction here. He jumps back and it breaks over the inside corner. The 2 and he got him. Another slider rings him up, two down. That's what buds do. Turned into a nice afternoon here in downtown Toronto. Glad you're with us from wherever you may be. Two nothing. The Orioles lead. Top of the fifth. Cedric Mullins the batter he struck out in the first and he homered in the third and this is a guy two years ago as you well know Buck he, had, he was a 30 30 guy 30 home runs and 30 stolen bases the power kind of tailed off last year stole 34 bases though was an all star and a silver slugger award winner two seasons ago and he was a switch hitter. He gave up the switch hitting and become, became strictly a left-handed batter. He was originally a left-handed hitter, and I spoke to him about that. And he said, yeah, I just didn't feel like I was accomplishing as much as I wanted to batting right-handed. So he went back to a straight left-handed hitter. It's interesting. Most guys who become switch hitters are originally right-handed batters. They start hitting left-handed. Uh, to get the platoon advantage the majority of the time against right handed pitchers if you're a speed guy you're closer to first base uh, so the way that he got into it was the unusual way right and hey, he's a good player like you say his numbers have dropped off a bit from two years ago Runner at first, two down. And the one two. And it's in the air to center field. Kiermeyer has it. No runs of base hit and a man left on to the bottom of the fifth. Set for the big game in Vegas, 2.30 Eastern on Sportsnet. And it's game two between the Stars and the Golden Knights, the Western Conference Final on Sportsnet CBC and Sportsnet Now. A little Ryobi pickleball paddle exhibition going on. As Santiago Espinal comes to the plate to lead off the bottom of the fifth. The Blue Jays two hits through four against Grayson Rodriguez. Both doubles, one by Espinal, one by Matt Chapman. So Espinal the start at second. Whit Merrifield is not in the lineup today. He's on the bench along with Alejandro Kirk, Kevin Biggio, and Nathan Lucas. And a few
you're Rodriguez, he missed there, but you can't blame either pitcher. I think Rodriguez's stuff may be a little bit better suited to it, Buck, just with that 97 mile an hour four seamer. Just keep it a little bit off the outside corner, see if you're getting the calls. Missed upstairs with that one. Yeah, it's been a wide strike zone for both pitchers. And the hitters just have to be aware of that. It's been really consistent from Dan Isonia, near the home plate on back. There's that pitch you got to guard against, that pitch that's outside. And if, if you can reach it, you try to spoil it because it's been a cold strike all afternoon. Now, would you get up on, and I know you've said a lot, hitters don't move around no. in the box, but would you get up on the plate another inch or two? Yeah, you try to, just to, because the umpire has been so consistent calling that pitch outside. Got jammed a bit, but he's going to loop it into center field for his second hit of the day as we send it down to Arden's well. Well, here's Kevin Kiermeyer, who you may remember missed a couple games earlier this week with that funky illness that's been going around the Blue Jays clubhouse. I caught up with Kevin after last night's game. I asked him how bad it was, and he just shook his head. It hit him out of nowhere after he played against the Yankees on Tuesday night. Found himself in the washroom at 3.30 in the morning experiencing some pretty severe gastrointestinal distress, then didn't eat anything at all for the next two days barely moved it was a really rough go for him Kiermaier's kids also had it but gone Friday feeling well enough to play got the hit feels like he's closer to 100 percent today whatever this is it has been running around the Blue Jay clubhouse for weeks I know Chapman had it Springer had it Simber had it Danny I, Jansen had Danny it. Jansen had yeah. it yep and that's not a surprise uh, together you know more than they are at home spend a lot of time in a clubhouse close confines they've got a dining room they all spend a lot of time in right center field Mullins a long run and he's there in time. Well, I'll tell you the quality of contact though that Kevin Kiermeyer has been making all season long. You know they got him for defense and base running and chipping when you can offensively. He's been way more than chipping when you can. Yeah, he's hitting the ball hard. He came into this game batting 447 against fastballs, and he's done a great job of hitting with two strikes. He's had a terrific start to his season. Here's Springer, 0 for 2. Well, here's where the Blue Jays have to get to Rodriguez right now. Third time you've seen him. This is the first start they have faced Grayson Rodriguez. Everybody knows what he features now. You got to get it ready. But if you're going to do something, here's where you got to do it. Top of the order. You've all seen him twice now. Manages three hits, and Espinal has two of them. Up and away, and it's two and zero. Oh. The bullpen is very good, as Buck talked about. Best bullpen ERA in baseball. Although their top two guys, Yanir Cano and Felix Bautista, both pitched last night. One through 19 pitches, one through 25. This one is well hit to left field. It is gone. <laughs> George Springer lines one into the Blue Jay bullpen to tie the game. Well, we talked about hitters seeing a new pitcher for the third time, and baseball is all aware of third time through the order, but George Springer connects. His sixth home run of the season makes it a 2 2 game. Espinal hitting in the eighth spot's been on base twice, and the Blue Jays need a little spark. And so far, Springer's the one that started it. Well, and this is a guy when he's going good, he's a spark guy. And as you say, boy, did they need this one. Yeah, good spot, and George know he got it all. And he didn't hit it a long way, but he did far enough. And 
Rodriguez and Rodriguez gives up a home run. Rodriguez has given up three home runs in a game in the past this season. But that two run home run and just made it a brand new ball game here in the fifth. Big swing and a miss from Bo Bichette. It was 0 for 2. He has reached on an error and struck out. Outside. Outside. The ball and a strike. Yeah, Springer hit a cutter, and it was a 90 mile an hour cutter, which becomes a 90 mile an hour fastball compared to the 98 mile an hour heater that Rodriguez has thrown most of the afternoon. He's working with a pickleball paddle on his stroke right there down in the dugout. Stayed inside yeah. it. <laughs> Haven't seen the Springer smile as much this year as you did the last couple of years but that'll help. Short. Two down. You know, John Schneider was asked before the game today with Kevin Kiermeyer swinging the bat so well, any temptation to move him? And if you think about where you might move him to, you know, he's not going to hit third, he's not going to hit fifth. You know, it could be the leadoff spot. And, and Schneider, on a couple of levels, I think has kind of resisted that. One is, and he alluded to this today. You know, Kiermaier's going, doing so well where he is. You don't want him to try to be anything different in another spot. And again, just, you know, horsing around and speculating here. But if you did move him to one, you're moving George Springer out of the leadoff spot. And I think there's just so much belief in the back of the baseball card, as they say, because of all of the good years that he's had. I think the last thing they want to do is take George Springer out of the yeah, leadoff. Absolutely. Spot. He's been one of the premier leadoff hitters since he came into the game. And once he established himself as that leadoff hitter for the Astros, I mean, he's historically one of the best leadoff hitters that we've seen. So I think they believe you leave Springer right where he is. The numbers will be where you want them to be at the end of the year. And again, Kiermeyer, it's almost like just don't change anything. No. And, and you know what? They're doing great in their respective spots. Yeah. And Kiermeyer has never gotten off to this good a start. And why would you move him? He's doing great. Rodriguez gets Vladdy. But Springer got Rodriguez for his sixth home run of the season. A much needed blast for the Blue Jays, who have tied it at two. League baseball historically bad pitching numbers that year huge leap forward a season ago to 83 and 79 most of the time when you see that there's kind of a plateau season after that then maybe you take another step forward but that doesn't appear to be the case Buck. not at all and they have gotten better and better I think last year gave them a lot of confidence we mentioned Adley Richmond coming up on May 21st a year ago and that turned the fortunes around for the Orioles and yeah one player cannot determine the success or failure of a team but boy when you have a catcher like Adley Rutschman he has such an impact on your entire team defensively as far as the pitching staff goes and certainly offensively he does a lot of things to help your ball club win. Rutschman leading off the six in a brand new ball game. I have said this before and he reminds me so much of Ted Simmons and he for me he's a better catcher than Ted Simmons but Simmons was a dramatic offensive player but he too like Rutschman was a switch hitter he had the same kind of stance slightly open stance from both sides of the plate and Simmons of course a Hall of Fame catcher Brandon Hyde was a catcher in his playing days and he understands the value of having somebody back there that's an everyday player and an offensive contributor. Yeah, if you think about offense, defense, and because you're a catcher, leadership, he checks all three boxes. Yeah. Right? Meanwhile, I think if you are watching Alec Manoa closely, as just about everybody on watching here today is, some um, definite 
encouraging signs that we have seen so far here today. Oh, no question about it. A lot of encouraging signs. And this is the third time the Orioles have faced Manoa in this game. Obviously, they faced him before. But third time through the order is always an interesting challenge for pitchers. Well, that's a good pitch. A lot of movement on that pitch. He got it inside and jammed Rutschman. Yeah, we've seen a, a little more crispness to his pitches today. It's a change up, but watch the movement. It's the same movement as his two seam fastball, which is ideal. That's exactly what you want. Hitters can see the rotation of the spin, and it says two seamer, but it's a change up. Fair ball. Guerrero's got it. Out number one. The hats, by the way, for people wondering, the caps that both teams are wearing. MLB uh, honors Military Appreciation Weekend throughout the United States this weekend. So the Blue Jays are wearing uh, a modified version just without the stars and stripes on it. So that is why the caps, I assume they will be here tomorrow as well. They were wearing them last night. Right. It's the entire thing. And. Today in the United States is Armed Forces Day, May 20th, and all weekend long they're going to wear these hats. And you see a lot of the teams are wearing camouflage colored socks and undershirts. Anthony Santander lines went into right field for a one out single. First hit for Santander. He grounded out to first and flying out to center. It's a change up again. And you can see how much more the plate it gets. And Santander is able to line it into right field. And Pete Walker's going to the mound. And I think just before he did, he made a phone call because there's some activity now. Let's see who's up. It is Tim Mesa. And after Mountcastle, the next four batters do up for the Orioles are all left handed batters. So this is your Tim Mazo window. I guess the issue is, you know, if Mountcastle were to get on, would Mazo be ready in time and would they make the move to Manoa so quickly? And there's the first of several left handed batters due to come up. Yeah, Mazo can get ready in time. He threw nine pitches last night and he was aware that he's got to crank it up in a hurry. And you can see he's throwing with intensity already. So he's already back on the rubber throwing full speed. But first, Mountcastle. The other thing too is and John Schneider and Don Mattingly know this very well is Brandon Hyde's got four right handed batters on the bench and certainly one of them Austin Hayes. He's a regular and a good player and if Mesa were to come in at some point Hayes would be pinch hitting for somebody. Maybe Vavra would be the most likely but might do it earlier if they're if they've got a couple of men on base. High in the air down the left field line a long run for Varsho and he will run out of room. Let's check in with Arden. You know one thing I've noticed about Alec Manoa today guys he is really leaning on his fastball. He's up to about 68 percent usage with it. You look at him against the Yankees his last time out it was 50 percent and in seven of his last eight starts he's been below 60 percent. So he's up to almost 70 today perhaps a game plan thing perhaps a little bit of day chances and back behind the plate as well. I think it's more the fact that Manoa has got a better fastball and he's throwing for strikes but that has complemented his other two pitches very well and that has set up his slider that has set up a change but everything has come together a little bit more effectively for him today. Whoa. Ouch. And on an 0 2 pitch Jansen was set up on the outside corner and Manoa hits Mountcastle. This has always been an issue with Alec Manoa and he's hit a lot of guys and he hit a lot of guys when he first got to the big leagues because he had so much run on that fastball. But look at what Jansen sets up completely off the plate outside and Manoa misses all the way across. I mean he missed by four feet. But you see how he gets underneath that ball. He never had command of that two seamer and it hits Mountcastle right in the arm. 
So the idea was to try to backdoor the two seamer to the outside corner and again he was ahead 0 and 2. Yeah and that's why Danny sat so far off the plate he wanted to start that ball off the plate and hopefully catch the inside corner. And now Adam Frazier who already has two hits today off Manoa a triple and a single. Had a third. Yeah, and, and Frazier's seen the ball very well out of Manoa's hand. And we mentioned he's a very good low ball hitter. And not a lot of power, just a line drive hitter that can hit the ball all over the ballpark. His triple was a line drive that Springer made a dive for, and it went past him all the way to the fence and right. And he circled around the base and ended up at third. It was a leadoff triple in the second inning. So two on with one out. Now back one and two. Up. That's where you have to tack Frazier. And up and away, ideally, you can get him to hit a fly ball to the left, and I don't think he has the kind of power to hit it out to the opposite field. So I would stay away from anything inside right now. He's better in, he's better down. Check the swing. They'll ask for the appeal, and he went around, says Adam Beck, the third base umpire. And some words between Frazier and Manoa right now after the strikeout. Now, I don't know what Manoa could have been saying to Frazier, but Frazier couldn't check his swing in time, and John Snyder's going to make a pitching change right here. And Manoa looks surprised. Well he hasn't made the signal and he jogged out there he might just be checking with him remember he did this once before with Bassett oh Pete was out you're right Pete Walker was already out this inning. So he's got it. Yeah. Yeah. Dan Iasonia is now joining them on the mound. We're not missing anything here right Pete Walker was Pete out Walker this was inning. out before. Um, Second two. That's what he said. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, John didn't know. He's got to make a change. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I was surprised. Yeah. I don't know why they thought they forgot that there was yeah. a second visit. No, I knew it was a second visit, yeah. and I thought, well, it's just a matter of time. He's just asking him some questions. Yeah. No, Schneider intended to look him in the eye and leave him in, but Pete Walker was already out, so you don't have a choice. Now Brandon Hyde, he wanted to make sure. Hey, wait a minute. What was going on there? So Manoa Dunn, Mesa coming in. Nice job from John Schneider, and I'm sure Schneider's talking to him about what just happened. And uh, obviously, they had forgotten that Pete Walker had gone out to the mound. I had forgotten too. Thank you, Buck, for rescuing me right there. And but it's automatic. Second visit in an inning, and you got to make a change. Yeah, and I'm surprised. We're going to go look in the last pitch that he threw, and this is Adam Frazier who checks his swing on a breaking ball, and he's called for a swing. And Manoa's pointing to Frazier, and then Manoa, his emotions go out to the mound, and then he says something to Frazier, and Frazier says something back to him. I mean, there was no reason to confront Frazier there. Now, this is when Snyder comes out. This is the second trip to the mound in the inning. So Snyder's got to make a pitching change. But he forgot because Dan Iasonia is going to come in from the right of your camera right now. And Iasonia says, John, you got to make a pitching right. change. And Schneider was going to leave Manoa. They were talking yeah. strategy right yeah. here, yeah. talking about the next pitch and talking to Jansen. And then here comes the crew chief, Dan Iasonia. He said, John, that's the second trip. And look at the look on Manoa's face yeah. when he's told. I mean, somebody on the bench, either Pete Walker or Don Mattingly, you know, when you see the manager going out for the second time in an inning, you've got to say, hey, hey, hey. I mean, it's happened to me before where you start to go out and you say, hey, you can't go out. And you know what? There's a lot going on in that dugout. But, you know, the pitching coach, Pete Walker, went to the mound earlier in the inning. And in the second visit, it's automatic. you got to take the pitcher out. 
So they have to make the change. Tim Mesa, who was warming up and is warm, comes into the game, but now they're doing some work on the mound. Tim Mesa obviously not comfortable with the the way the mound was right now, so we've got a bit of a delay. This is a big spot. Tie game, two on, two out. And Brandon Hyde has made a counter move with Tim Mesa coming in. He is going to send up. Well, there are two right handed batters out right now, so the question is will it be Ortiz or will it be Hayes? I'm not sure we can tell definitively which one is going to bat. For me, it looks like Ortiz yeah. is going to bat first. He's getting a closer look at Mesa where he is standing in the yeah. on deck circle. I think he's going to hit first, and then Hayes would hit second if the inning continues. And Ortiz would be uh, an easier positional switch for Gunnar Henderson, so that probably yeah, makes sense as well. Yeah, he goes one for one there, yeah. and then if Hayes hits for O'Hearn, he becomes the DH. Interesting. So Brandon Hyde loaded up his lineup with lefties against Alec Manoa. They had seven of them in there, including the switch hitters. And that meant he had four righties on his bench. So, you know, if you're John Schneider, you're saying, where can I use Mesa? There's the spot where all the lefties are coming up. But Brandon Hyde is going to bring a couple of righties off the bench. Yeah, and Ortiz played third base last night. He went one to three in the game. Hitting 238 for the season. He didn't have much power. No extra base hits so far. This is after the pitching change when and obvious I think what they are talking about right now. So the intent was to leave Manoa. To face Henderson but instead it is Mesa to face Ortiz. And Mesa starts him with a slider for a strike. Throw down to first, runner back in safely. The Blue Jays last year had some success. First and second, right handed batter, Vladdy sneaking in behind the runner, but the Jays themselves have said they kind of know that other teams have scouted them on this, so other teams are a little bit more aware. Yeah, and Vladdy puts that play on when he senses yeah. that runner is taking a big lead. Long run, Kiermeyer. And he's got it. Kevin Kiermeyer doing Kevin Kiermeyer things out in deep right center field. And Manoa and Mesa may be the two happiest guys in the ballpark right now, Buck. Kiermeyer has great speed. He jumps perfectly timed and up against the wall. That catch ends the inning, gets Mesa out of it. Two earned runs, just one walk in the game today. Did hit a batter as well, but better command. And now the conversation after the inning. And uh, if if we are accurate in our lip reading ability, John Schneider saying, I'm sorry, that's my fault. Yeah, man, it happened from time to time. I mean, there's a lot going on down on the field, a lot going on in the dugout. And, uh, you know, John Schneider went out there with no intention whatsoever of making a pitching change, but the rules forced him into it. Here's Brian Baker, the former Blue Jay, who's having a terrific start to his season. Look at his opponent's batting averages, 188. And you know this is the one thing a real strength of this ball club is the depth of their bullpen and they've got some good arms in their bullpen and Baker is one of them. As expected Joey Ortiz stays in the game at third after pinch hitting for Gunnar Henderson. So Grayson Rodriguez five innings today for the Orioles gives up the two runs on the Springer homer. Baker with a big arm can be prone to a bit of wildness command issues from time to time. And a guy who of course was with the Blue Jays only made one major league appearance with the Blue Jays but was in the system for a while and a lot of fans may remember last year he and Teoscar Hernandez of all people having words during a heated game. Yeah, the Orioles have discovered that when you give Baker ample rest, he really is effective, and this changeup moves right over to the heart of the plate. And backs it up with a good heater. Strikes out Belt. Good sequence of pitches. Belt strikes out for a second time. 
Well the fact that he's in the game in the sixth inning buck says to me that their top two guys you Cano and Felix Bautista are both in play today. Otherwise I think maybe Baker would come in a little bit later on because he's kind of their number three guy. I don't yeah. think Cano is going to be in play. He's pitched in three of the four Oriole games most recently. Bautista I think he's in play he's the closer and he didn't have an intense inning of work last night right. by the time he came in he had warmed up then they got the extra runs in the ninth inning and he kind of just breezed through the night. Here's Matt Chapman who was one for two doubled off the right field fence his last time up. Their bullpen has been used a lot they have made 18 appearances in the last five games. So the seven innings they got last night from Kyle Gibson a very welcome sight for the Orioles. Two balls and a strike they appeal but he didn't go. By the way the double for Chapman is 19th on the season he is still the major league leader in that department three ahead of anybody else. Baker threw 24 pitches on Thursday afternoon did not pitch in the game last night and then he had appearances Monday and Tuesday so he's pitched a lot recently. Popped up back of the plate. Rutschman back to the screen and he's got room and makes the play. More NBA playoffs coming your way tonight on Sportsnet. LeBron and the Lakers are looking for answers. Kitchener, Ontario's Jamal Murray and the Nuggets have a two games to none lead. Game three of the Western Conference Finals tonight at 8 Eastern on Sportsnet 1 and Sportsnet Now. Murray with 23 points in the fourth quarter in game two. Here's Danny Jansen. Meanwhile Trevor Richards now up in the Blue Jay pen and, and this is interesting because two lefties are scheduled but we kind of already know Brandon Hyde would send Austin Hayes up there. So does Mesa come back out or does Trevor Richards come on because they're comfortable with Richards against lefties. Lots of decisions in a baseball game. Yeah man for sure and that's why Richard is so. Important because he can neutralize left-handed bats. So if you do get a change and stick with the same guy, it doesn't make any difference. Get out of here. Jansen lines it. Gone. Boy, he can some kind of go down and dig one out down and in. And he lines it into the Blue Jay bullpen to give him the lead. Now Danny Jansen's had some big hits on this homestand, including a pair of walk-off hits. Boy, you're right. He's a good low ball hitter, and he got that ball down. And he's starting to swing the bat the way we hoped he would. Yeah, that's a big home run here in the six. And a walk off home run, a walk off base hit on Mother's Day, and yeah, things are starting to turn in the right direction for Danny Jensen. And if you're looking for areas where the offense can take a jump. Uh, Danny Jansen at the peak of his game he can be a, a very productive player we saw that last year around a couple of stints on the I.L. What's the location of this four seam fastball it is right down in his wheelhouse remember he had a home run off for Andy Peralta on a low slider in extra innings against New York. And he can hammer the low pitches. That's the pitch that Varsho has to lay off of. That's the one he's getting a steady diet of, and it's a borderline high strike. But they have just gone up the ladder against him.
And he went after that high fastball and popped it up. This could be a challenge. Mountcastle makes the catch as he and Ortiz almost collide. The Jansen home run has given the Blue Jays a 3 to 2 lead as we get an update with Jamie Campbell. He is projecting that tomorrow's 50 50 jackpot may surpass a million dollars. It's over 700,000 right now, and it goes until tomorrow night. And I am lucky enough to be able to call the winner on Monday. So let's keep those tickets coming in. Let's see how big of a jackpot we can get. Visit bluejays.com slash 50 50 from anywhere in Ontario to get your tickets right now. You got my number, right? I got your number okay. on speed dial. Thank you. 85 pitches for Alec Mano. He had a good outing. Two earned runs. He only walked one through some very good pitches, and that's a step in the right direction for the big guy. And he got out of it. He was going to pitch longer, but there was a little mix up between mound visits, and he was taken out of the game by rule. So now the third pitcher to work this afternoon, Trevor Richards, Tim Mesa, retired the pinch hitter Joey Ortiz, and now it's Trevor Richards. So this keeps Austin Hayes on the bench as Brandon Hyde will leave his lefties Ryan O'Hearn and Terran Favre with then Jorge Mateo do up. This is the seven eight nine part of the Baltimore lineup. No swing. I well, mean the Blue Jays don't have another left hander in their pen. So those other guys might end up the day sitting on the That's bench right. the rest of the afternoon. That's right. A nice step forward for Alec Manoa here this afternoon. However this one winds up. Yeah, you know, it's 10th start. He's probably going to have 22 more starts over the course of the season. And if he has 22 more like today and better, everybody's going to end up happy. Took a change, two and two. And already Eric Swanson starting to throw. down for a base hit Springer will cut it off and hold O'Hearn to a long single you see he throws him a fastball and he squares it up O'Hearn's had a couple of good swings here he was slider off Manoa in the second inning for a base hit to right and now uh, Springer did a good job to get over to cut that one off keep it from going to the wall so now Vavra who is one for two. Chapman creeping in at third as Vavra sends one high in the air to left. Backing up, but with room is Varsho. The runner draws a throw, and Varsho put it pretty close to right on the money at second base on the fly. Yeah, Don Varsho doesn't make any mistakes defensively in the outfit, whether he's playing left or playing center. And he could hear Kiermaier hollering from center. He's tagging, he's tagging, so he unloads in a hurry to keep O'Hearn from. Even thinking about going. So now Jorge Mateo, the number nine hitter. Baltimore bullpen is busy as well with right hander Mike Bauman now throwing. <laughs> Owen to the count. And it's hooked foul. As you can see, not a lot of empty seats here. They just announced the attendance 41,611, a sellout here at the Rogers Center. Well, all the empty seats are out in those outfield <laughs> areas right. now. They're just wandering around and they are jam packed. Park Social, Corona Rooftop Patio, West Jet Flight Deck. That's where all the people are that have left the empty seats inside the bowl. Not bad for the long weekend, too, right? Yeah, and the bleachers. I went out to those bleachers last night and had a ball. Sat in the middle of the bleachers and I signed a couple of autographs and had a good time. Just a couple, I'm sure. Posed for a few pictures, made a few friends. Another fly ball to left. This one much shallower. Two down.
Tonight, Hockey Central gets you set for game two of the Eastern Conference Final. Only took it to the fourth overtime to decide game one. Florida Carolina rested and ready tonight on Sportsnet CBC and Sportsnet Now. Boy, big spot here. Huh? One run game, seventh inning, tying run aboard, and a dangerous hitter with the plate in Cedric Mullins. Mullins has had big numbers against Rich. Richards is five for nine against Trevor. Now he's going to get that changeup. Pal back just below us. That one might be in the radio booth. And it's one and two. Good come. Lottie Guerrero, you can see him covering up his head just so he can hear Pitchcom. He will wear Pitchcom, and it's really important with a left handed hitter in Trevor Richards because of that changeup. If you hear changeup call, you know that you're going to shade the pool side and you're going to think about balls being hit to you. So that's why he's trying to hear Pitchcom and not be. In between pitches. Yeah, both first basemen belt in Guerrero like having it. You know, I think one day, I don't think we're that far away from anybody having it. Well, yeah, I don't understand yeah. actually why you I, can only I, have I think five. it's a good idea. Give it all, give it to anybody who wants yeah. it. Yeah. But now it's limited to five. Yeah. Full they, count. They give it to the quarterbacks. Yeah. Rutschman on deck. The runner will be on the move. As Richards tries to get out of this here in the top of the seventh. Guerrero backing up behind the runner. There he goes. And it's ball four. So it's first and second two down with Adley Rutschman coming to the plate. And here comes John Schneider to make a pitching change. No, Richard's not wanting to give in to Mullins, who's had big numbers against him. So we'll have a pitching change here in this tie game. Excuse me, the Blue Jays are up three to two. Nights at the ballpark. Over 60,000 Looney Dogs were sold this past Tuesday. Join us on Tuesday, May the 30th, for the next Looney Dogs night. Visit bluejays.com/slash tickets. Good ball game here today. The Blue Jays have come back from a two to nothing deficit to take a three to two lead, but. A couple of men on for the Orioles with two down in the seventh as Eric Swanson comes in. As Swanson pitched two thirds of an inning in the game last night, he gave up two runs on two hits, including a home run to Adam Frazier. Struck out two, and that's what he is in here to do strike out Adley Rutschman. Swanson has 27 strikeouts in 22 innings of work. Big spot here against one of the Orioles' best hitters. A reason they've made this switch is Rutschman's never faced Swanson, so he give him somebody he hasn't seen before. And Swanson does the right thing, gets ahead of him. To left center field. Tracking it is Kiermeyer, and he's got it. Feeling for the wall, but knew he had room. And Swanson strands a couple of runners. Has been terrific at the plate this year. That has been a big boost for the Blue Jays. One thing you knew coming in was what he would do for you in the outfield. Yeah, he's a Gold Glove defender in center field, and this is last night. You say Kikuchi makes a pickoff throw, goes into center. Austin Hayes gets up and tries to advance to third, but you talk about throwing a strike on the money. And then the defense here this afternoon. This is going to end the seventh inning up against the fence and takes an extra base hit away from Adley Rutschman to end the inning. Made that in support of Tim Mazer, and that closed out the Orioles in the seventh.
He can do a lot of things to help you win. His speed on the bases has forced the defense in with some mistakes, and he's hitting the ball as well as he ever has at any point in his big league career. And a new pitcher into the game for the Orioles. We saw him warming up an inning ago. Right hander Mike Bauman comes in. Another guy with pretty good numbers again. This Baltimore bullpen is deep, and as Buck told you earlier, it is going to get deeper. Their starting pitching numbers are overall just so so, but their bullpen has done a great job. Coming into this game, they were tied with the Houston Astros with ERA out of the bullpen at 301. And as I mentioned, their bullpen has pitched a lot lately. Bauman's got a big fastball, just like the rest of his bullpen mates. And how about Santiago Espinal having a big day at the plate. He doubled his first time up had a leadoff single that set up the two run home by Homer by George Springer. So he's had a very productive plate and once again for the third time he's going to lead things off. Big cut and he comes up empty it's 0 and 1. Espinal, Kiermaier, and Springer here in the seventh inning. The Blue Jays being out hit seven to five, but a leading three to two. They got two home runs, Springer and Jansen. Swing there on that high breaking ball, but somehow Espinal, that's why he got a big smile on his face. That wasn't maybe his prettiest swing, but it's a base hit. Now that's what you do with two strikes. You just protect the plate and watch this swing on the curveball. It's a high curveball. He steps and waits, but he uses his hands to get to the baseball. It wasn't pretty, as you mentioned, and his knees buckled a bit, but he has a little smile as he heads towards first base. I'll take it. Thank you very much. Three for three. So now Kiermaier. Here's another perspective on how well Kiermaier is doing. Look at the OPS numbers for the nine guys in the lineup today. And there's Kiermaier just behind Chapman and just ahead of Guerrero and Bichette in what he's done this season. Now he's had a fine season and you think about it and this is like I said this is the best start to his season that he's had in his career. Boy, I'll tell you, Espinal had a couple of big sidesteps towards second, and you wouldn't think he's going 0 and 2 with the big boys coming up at the top of the order, but he's getting a pretty big lead over there. Nothing wrong with a big secondary lead. Now, and two, you know, start the runner, and if he's forced out in second, you're not going to double up Kiermaier, and then you've got a little faster runner. Well, the or Orioles think saw he it, might yeah. be going. <laughs> Modified pitch out it was. There, right? Yeah, it was very, stretch. very yeah. subtly done by yeah. Bretzman. He's running. Swing and a miss. Throw down into center. Espinal will hold his ground as he steals second on the the Kiermaier strikeout. And is he okay? Now oh he's boy. got something wrong. Yeah. I don't know what happened but whatever it is he's feeling something in his lower body. And Jose Ministral and John Schneider are on their way out. Nothing on the break. He looks fine there, there. but he pulled yeah. up. Yeah it's a hamstring. Yeah. He reached back to his right hamstring. Watch just before he gets to second base he's going to hold up and pull up. He feels something right there. Yeah. And then he's going to grab the back of his right hamstring. 
Ah, that's too bad. That is really too bad. You hope it's minor, but a three hit game, you know, maybe a chance to get back in there tomorrow, swinging the bat better. A guy who has not had the kind of start to this year, obviously, that he had last year. So hopefully, this is not too significant of a thing for Santiago Espinal. And it looks like Kevin Biggio is going to head into the game in his spot. Or is it Whit Merrifield? Yeah, it's Whit. Loosen up his legs, and just right there, he felt something give in his right hamstring. And as he gets to second base, he kind of reaches back, and that's not good news for Santiago Espinal nor the Blue Jays. So Merrifield to pinch run. He's at second with one out. And he's got to do everything he can do in about 30 seconds to get as loose as he can get. And now Springer, who hit a two run home run his last time up. Merrifield running. And he'll steal third without a throw as soon as he comes into the game. Why not? Nobody's expecting it. So he's just kind of a courtesy runner, but Merrifield picks up another stolen base. Moves off, moves off, no chance. I mean, Redsman can't even come out of his crouch. And Springer just dropped the bat on his shoulder. Either he knew he was going or he saw how good of a jump he got. Ground ball's going to be off the glove of the shortstop, Mateo, and Merrifield is in to score. Uh, what Merrifield, he made it happen, didn't he? He stole third base, and that forces the Orioles to play the infield in, and then Mateo got a wicked hop at shortstop, and it goes off his glove. Merrifield comes in to score the fourth Blue Jay run. It'll be an infield hit for Springer, and he's had a big RBI day, and Merrifield was breaking on contact. So he was going to force the hand of the Orioles to make a play, and they didn't. There goes Springer. And he's in there safely. And they're still tangled up. And it looks like they're both okay. Is Springer all right, though? And now Luis Rivera and Mark Budzinski are over to check on him. Yeah, the way he took his helmet off suggests they may have hit the leg of Mateo, and here's the head first slide. And indeed, yeah. he hit the left leg of Mateo with his head right there. And that's why he popped that helmet off. So he took a shot. So a couple of tough stolen bases for the Blue Jays in the last couple of attempts. And you can see Springer immediately reaching back for his neck. He hit Mateo's left leg pretty hard on that head first slide. Boon Chong out along with John Schneider to check on Springer. Uh, Mateo, he got hit pretty hard. They're making sure that Springer is okay, that he's responsive to those tests. And uh, you can see his neck's pretty sore. Uh, this is the these are the perils of sliding head first. You subject yourself to so many different situations, and he hit that leg hard. And he turned his head to the side before he got there. He's going to stay in the game. He could tell from the way Mateo was kind of reaching towards him that the ball might be right in his path, but fortunately, Springer okay and staying in the game. So three stolen bases in the inning buck by three different players. Wow. Espinal, Merrifield, and Springer. And that's what you do when you're scuffling to score runs. Play aggressively, you know, throw caution to the wind and just turn the offense loose. Let the runners run. You create pressure on the defense to make plays. 
Now Bo Bichette. Bo 0 for 3 on the afternoon. The Blue Jays now up 4 to 2 as they bat here in the bottom of the seventh. There's another great stat. It just indicates how good Bo is. Seventh inning or later, you're facing facing the best they have out of their bullpen. Just missed, and he just was able to check the swing. But that time went after it, and he strikes out two down. Here comes Vladdy now, and this is just moments ago. Pointing out a young fan to one of the uh, one of the staff members for the Blue Jays and sending a bat, making a memory. How about that? <laughs> a great memory. Guerrero is 0 for 3 today. And there you can see the young fan with the bat on his shoulder right in the background there in the first row. That's uh, you know pretty special to take to school for show and tell. Huh? I would say. Now, not only did I get a bat, but I was on TV. Yeah. Glad he gets it. Ninety-eight upstairs. Boy, when's the last time a guy came out of a bullpen throwing ninety-one? <laughs> no, it doesn't happen much unless it's Adam Simber, one yeah. of those kind of guys. Yeah. Hey, George Springer reminded Vladdy, hey, make him come down. Nobody has been up in the Blue Jay pen, so Eric Swanson will be coming back out for the eighth. Wow, tough take. He executed that pitch pretty well. Three and two. If I'm Blatty, I got to look for another breaking ball. First base is open, two outs. Springer at second base. I don't think they're going to give you a fastball, Daddy. You're right. And it's ball four. Enter the TD Grand Slam contest for your chance to be George Springer and more. A pitching change here for the Orioles. Left hander Cole Irvin will be coming into the game now. 4 2 Blue Jays in the seventh. Tomorrow to take part in the fun. Remember, new this year, you've got to register for a time slot to run the bases. Visit bluejays.com slash tickets. Blue Jays have scored a run here in the bottom of the seventh now lead four to two and Brandon Hyde has gone to his bullpen again. Carl Irvin was just recalled on the 15th of May. This is only his fourth appearance of the season. He'll throw you a fastball occasional change up curveball and a cutter. Well Andrew Kirk's going to bat for Brandon Bell but the D.H. finishes up over two with a walk. They're trying to get Kirk going a little bit. He has not had a good month in May and showing some signs of coming around, but he gets an opportunity here with two board. 
Springer at second, Guerrero at first. And in for a strike, 0 1. With that hit, Alejandro Kirk is now four for six against Cole Irvin. Springer comes in to score for the second time today. And a four-seam fastball, and Kirk, he's been working hard to get on top of these pitches, and he ropes this one into center. Big extra run here, and the pinch hitter delivers. Here's Matt Chapman. Chapman today, one for three, had a double back in the fourth. So the first three runs the Blue Jays scored came on a home runs a two run shot and a solo homer this inning has been more about contact and base steal just keeping the line moving. But Merrifield came in the game as a pinch runner and on the first pitch he stole third base and he scored on the infield base hit by Springer. George has had three RBIs this afternoon. up by Chapman and the inning is over but the Blue Jays add on a couple of runs and now lead five to two at the end of seven as we get a Blue Jays central update with Jamie and Caleb. First, the first 15,000 fans will receive a Beau Bichette white replica jersey and a replica headband. Go to bluejays.com slash tickets. A Beau bundle. Once down two to nothing, now up five to two, going to the eighth inning. Blue Jays come in having lost four of their last five. Whit Merrifield stays in the game at second base after pinch running for Santiago Espinal. Eric Swanson's back on the mound. And Anthony Santander leads it off for Baltimore. Ball four. Well, let's revisit a story from half an inning ago when we saw Vladimir Guerrero Jr. direct one of the Blue Jays' club uh, or dugout or clubhouse staff to send a bat to a young fan behind the plate. A little bit of digging, and we have uncovered a little bit more information here. This young fan in a Bo Bichette jersey was holding up a sign earlier. Hey, Bo. I beat cancer. I can't see the rest. It looks like like you beat the pitcher. Yeah. The point is that is a cancer survivor. 
that young man behind the plate and obviously Vladdy aware of that as the Blue Jays will turn one but not two so an even more heartwarming story there good on you Vladdy for uh, giving that young fan a bat and again just uh, the memory of a lifetime. Yeah absolutely and there he is right there and he had that sign up earlier in the game and good on our crew to have that and we went back and looked at it and now he is the proud owner of a Vladdy Guerrero bat. That's awesome. A fielder's choice for Ryan Mountcastle and Blue Jays will take that. Just put him at first base and get an out in the process at second the way that he can swing the bat against him. Here's Adam Frazier who is two for three. Teammates facing one another. Frazier and Swanson together with the Mariners last year. Pete Walker on the horn down to the bullpen. Fred Romano is throwing in. Pitch much lately. He is in play today and maybe for more than an inning obviously if he's up now it means that John Schneider would go to him this inning if it if need be. Romano uh, threw two innings on Wednesday yeah. through 23 pitches at a very quick ninth inning came back for the tenth and picked up the win. That was the Danny Jansen walk off home run night. Line foul down the line. Five to two. It seems like everything is good in Blue Jay Land. <laughs> <laughs> well, some would say check back with you in five outs or so. But, uh, they, they need a win. Just five and ten within their own division. You know, in, in a division as competitive as the American League East is, you got to hold your own against the others. about that he somehow got to that pitch and lines it down the left field line for a base hit as we go down to Arden on the field a quick update for you guys on Santiago Espinal it is as Buck suspected right hamstring discomfort is the reason that Espinal was lifted from today's game no further update beyond that but I would expect that he'll go for imaging and we'll hear more tomorrow. Yeah, it didn't look good. And when you run like that and you feel something give, you know that it's a hamstring. And I'd be surprised if he can avoid a stint on the IL. Pete Walker out to talk things over with Eric Swanson. The Orioles are going to use a pinch hitter, Austin Hayes, their left fielder, to not start this game. Uh, with Alec Manoa on the mound and now he's coming off the bench to hit for Joey Ortiz the pinch hitter who hit in the sixth inning and took over defensively Gunnar Henderson started at third base. So now the third batter in this spot will be Austin Hayes and the tying run at the plate with one out here in the eighth. Down and away for ball one. Hayes a 303 hitter, five homers and 145 at bats. And he's actually hit righties better than lefties this year. Better average, more power. Splinter there as it fooled Hayes and he was off stride so he just took the pitch for his strike. Good grip on that split goes straight down and Hayes out in front you can see how his weight was on his front foot and he just couldn't pull the trigger and decided hey I better not swing at it. It'd be a weak grounder somewhere. This is first pinch hitting at bat of the season. The everyday left fielder. Swanson in front of him, one and two. And he got him to 
chase a ball outside two down. Well he mentioned that Swanson's a strikeout pitcher he's averaged more than a strikeout per inning and this is a high high splitter. But you can see Ace is still out in front of it. It came out of his hand it was upstairs he thought fastball you can see he swings way before the ball ever gets to home plate. So now Ryan O'Hearn who is two for three today a couple of base hits to right field and now John Schneider has come out and he has already pointed to the bullpen I believe I think he already pointed for Jordan Romano. Wanted to give Romano a few more pitches but he's going to ask Jordan Romano to get four outs here today. Now Swanson gets a big strikeout two runners aboard and I tell you this really tells you how important Snyder feels about winning this game. For the Blue Jays right now is Jordan Romano being asked to come in and get the last out here in the eighth. Just the third time that he will pitch more than an inning. He pitched two innings as we mentioned on Wednesday through a total of just 23 pitches. So he's had a couple days off. He's in good shape and obviously communicated to the pitching coach. Hey I'm ready if you need me today and the Blue Jays need him. Runners at first and second two down in the eighth inning in the batter the D.H. Ryan O'Hearn. Fastball and a swing and a miss. 0 and 1. Romano has used his fastball much more effectively lately. And by more effectively, do you mean aggressively? Aggr effectively, yeah. yeah. He's using it more than he has earlier in the season. He's always been a slider heavy guy. There's the slider, two and one. in there two and two came right back with it. This is the ninth game Romano has pitched at home. He has pitched a total of nine innings allowed just three hits. A 100 opponents batting average He's not allowed to run pitching at home. Wow 97 right in on his hands. This one lifted to right center and deep and it is gone. Ryan O'Hearn with a three run home run to tie it here in the eighth. He sped up his bat with that slider man he got out in front with two strikes. Hitters are just cutting their swing down trying to put the bat on the ball. And he goes back to the slider and right over the heart of the plate and he knows it's gone. Uh, as we mentioned that's the first time he's given up runs here at home this season. But with two strikes it's you better throw a breaking ball out of the zone a swing and miss slider is the only way to attack a left handed hitter. But it came back to that slider and it cost him. So a couple of runs charged to Swanson the last one obviously to Romano and Baltimore has tied it at five and to say they have quieted the crowd here would be an understatement. Well, knows he got it and he puts the Orioles back out on top. A 
And so Hearns first hit against Ramirez only had two at bats and this is a big one. Mullins hit a home run in the third and no Hearn has tied it up. And now a base hit by Vavra. It's a fastball, and Barbara, we talked about his short swing. He's got a good compact swing. He's able to barrel up that pitch and get it into the outfield. Now, slider for a strike to Jorge Mateo. So the Orioles led two to nothing. The Blue Jays tied it, took a five to two lead eventually, and Baltimore roars back here with a two out three run homer here in the eighth. And Yanir Cano, who has been really a huge success story so far this year, gave up his first run of the season last night, but has been virtually unhittable. He's now up in the pen. Bouncer to Merrifield. The flip to Bichette is just in time to force the runner and retire the side, but not before one big swing of the bat has tied it. Kiermeyer hit a line drive single off Cano in last night's ball game. He got to first base. Ryan Mountcastle told him, "Hey man, you're in rare company. No one's done anything off this guy all year." And Kiermeyer replied, "Well, it's an honor, and that's all tongue in cheek, obviously, but it is pretty remarkable that the Blue Jays got to Cano for a couple of hits in a run on Friday, considering how utterly dominant this guy has been this season. He entered that outing having retired 62 of the 67 batters he'd faced on the season." No walks, no runs, 25 strikeouts, and a monstrous 73% ground ball rate. He gets it done with a sinker and a changeup that both look the same out of his hand, coming out of that funky low arm slot, but then come towards the plate at very different rates of speed. I asked Kiermaier what his approach was against Cano. He said, I was just looking for a changeup up. I know that this guy is going to be nasty. And you know, Cano hadn't given up a hit off that changeup all year, but Kiermaier got to him. Blue Jays need a similar approach here against the nasty Orioles reliever. Arden, thank you. 29 years of age from Cuba as Tamron Vavra moves from left field to third base. Austin Hayes stays in and left. Cano signed with Minnesota in 2019, came over to Baltimore in the Jorge Lopez deal at the deadline last year. Had no success in the majors last year briefly with the Orioles and the Twins uh, spent more time at Triple A didn't even make the opening day roster this year but now as Arden says he has been arguably the most effective reliever in baseball so far this season. I talked to Brandon Hyde the manager of the Orioles yesterday about Cano he said yep we were headed to Chicago and they had a lot of right handed hitters in. Our bullpen hadn't been performing very well, and I said we need somebody from Triple A. And he was told, "Hey, Cano's throwing great. He's had four scoreless appearances." So they took a shot and put him in the Chicago series, and literally the rest is history. He is just quick, and what a one-two punch they have at the back end of their bullpen. Pulled down to third. Vavra tested right away and makes the play one down. And that was a changeup. And Cano's got great movement on his fastball and his changeup. Very similar. Two seam fastball, two seam changeup. He wants a baseball. He doesn't have a baseball. It's very difficult to pitch <laughs> without a baseball. Look at the replay. One down. He's got a baseball now, and he's got Dalton Varsho in the box. Varsho hitting is 0 for 3 today. Nobody up in the Blue Jay pen, by the way. Jordan Romano threw 14 pitches, and it looks like he's coming back out one way or another.
Basho thinking about bunting for a base hit takes it down and away for ball two. He hasn't bunted that often against right handed pitchers but he knows he's scuffling a bit right now he just wants to get on board. Bounces it foul two and two. A home run that Romano surrendered just the second home run he's allowed this season. Both of them have come in the month of May. He gave up a home run to the Red Sox in Boston on May 1st. That's the change up again. Drifts outside and a full count now on Varsho with Whit Merrifield on deck. Out of play. Trying to keep busy in the dugout. His spot still a ways away. Boy, that's a ton of movement for a two seam fastball. Man, he's a big guy. He's 6 4, and he has kind of a sidearm delivery, and he reports an awful lot of movement. I mean, that thing looked like it moved 18 inches from the time he let it go. Look at how, how you have to reach for that change up down and away. As Arden said, similar horizontal and vertical movement, just different speeds. That is so tough for a hitter. Yeah, and you know, you see the release point, you see the spin on the baseball, and it tells you two seamer, and then it's about 10 miles an hour slower. So if you do make contact, it's going to be soft contact. I mean, that number right there is ridiculous. 74 batters faced. 67 retired. 75 batters faced. 67 retired. Merrifield digging for second. And out. Looking into the dugout just in case. But no, it doesn't look like they're challenging. He's taken off the glove. He knows he was out. So a single and out trying to stretch it into a double. One more look. Merrifield trying to make Ball something happen. At second base, Toronto has challenged. And the Blue Jays are challenging, actually. A little bit interesting. It was a little bit closer than I expected it to be because he took that right arm away from Fraser. He extended his right arm and took it away and then grabbed the base with his left hand. Going to be a difficult one to overturn from the replay we've seen so far. Here's another look at it. Frazier reaches to tag him. He extends that left hand and hits the base, but difficult to tell when yeah. contact was made. I don't think he got him on the left hand. Uh, the fans are reacting to the play up on the video board, but he, Ooh, he takes his right hand away, yeah. extends for the base with his left hand, and Frazier reaches for him. And that's probably the best replay we see right there on the big screen. Did he get the hand yeah. on? The tag was on his right arm. Frazier missed the left arm, but it got him on the right arm. But did the left arm get in there before? That's going to be a tough one to overturn. I, it I'm is that you. close. It's so close, yeah. And so if it's that close, the call on the field usually dictates the result. This is a good look here. The left hand and then the tag on the right arm. Boy, you're talking about fractions of an inch. Yeah, and that's difficult yeah. to overturn. Worthy of a challenge, though, in a tie game in the eighth inning. After review, the call on the field stands. The runner is out. Toronto loses your challenge. On to the top of the ninth. Back at the ballpark June 9th and 10th Pride Weekend presented by TD on June 9th the first 15,000 fans will receive a Blue Jays rainbow flag jersey visit BlueJays.com slash tickets. So here we go top nine tied at five Jordan Romano back into the game and it's the top of the order coming up for the Orioles. 
Beginning with Cedric Mullins, who is one for three with a walk, the one a home run. Mullins, Rutschman, and Santander. So Romano coming on with two on and two out in the eighth inning. Surrendered the home run to Ryan O'Hearn that tied it. And obviously the Blue Jays don't want him to throw too many pitches here. If he's out there for another 15, 20 pitches this inning, he's well up into the 30s. So Jimmy Garcia is getting up as backup just in case. And now a warning to Romano that he can't come set until the hitter is set first in the box. Two and two. Meanwhile, on the other side, Felix Bautista. 6'8, 260 with a 99 mile an hour fastball. He has been one of the best closers in baseball so far this year. Popped up. Chapman coming over. Chapman with room. It's not quite like in Oakland when Chapman played there. He'd had another 40 feet of room there, yeah. but he had just enough here. He's used to running down those foul pop ups. He had so many of those great plays in Oakland. He had all kinds of room to room in foul territory. Now, Adley Rutschman, who was 0 for 3 with a walk. Looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth, the Blue Jays will have Kevin Kiermeyer, George Springer, and Bo Bichette coming up. Oh. Out of town, the Rays are up seven to three on Milwaukee in the seventh. The Yankees are in Cincinnati, tied at four. Red Sox play tonight in San Diego. Did you see that Rafael Devers and Xander Bogarts brought the lineup cards out last yeah, night in San cool. Diego? And then Devers hit one nine miles to deep center field as they beat up on Blake Snell. Two and two. Rutschman didn't like it and asked for a timeout. Pitch looked off the plate, called the strike. That one looked on the plate, called the ball. That had plenty of plate. And then it's lined in the left for a base hit. Matchman's actually had three pretty good plate appearances today. He Hit one to the warning track in the third and left and took Kiermaier up against the wall in right center in the seventh and now he gets his first hit of the afternoon. John Snyder getting ready he put that scatter report in his back pocket that's for Jimmy Garcia. The first Santander.
Pitch number 28 upcoming for Romano. Just the third time he's thrown that many in a game this year. He threw 23 on Wednesday, as we mentioned, in that two inning extra inning win for the Blue Jays. He picked up the W. The most he's thrown 31 against the Angels on April the 9th. And it's two and two. Tell you these guys are some tough outs. These yeah. are good at bats they have. Well, Rick Kranitz, the pitching coach for the Atlanta Braves, said the Orioles lineup was the toughest team they had to pitch against this season. Just in the way they handle their at bats. They don't chase a lot. They make you throw a lot of pitches. They make you throw it over. Tough lineup. Got him. Climb the ladder, two down. But here comes John Schneider. So that's the end of the line for Jordan Romano as Schneider will ask Jimmy Garcia to come in to face Ryan Mountcastle. Five five tie here in the ninth. Kevin Gosman against the ball Blue Jays Central at one o'clock Eastern first pitch just after one thirty Dean Kramer starts for the Orioles in the final game of the homestand. Of course, that's our first team that Kevin Gosman pitched for. He's number one pick of the Orioles out of LSU. Jimmy Garcia on here, trying to close out the Orioles in this 5-5 game on the top of the ninth. Garcia has thrown well lately. He had a big outing on Thursday when he came into the game and struck out Aaron Judge in the seventh inning. To keep the Blue Jays within striking distance at that time, it was a 3 2 game. Runner at first, two down, and Ryan Mountcastle at the plate. He is 0 for 3 and has been hit by a pitch in this one. As I'm sure a lot of people know, a guy who has tormented the Blue Jays time and time again in his career. And his first two major league home runs against the Blue Jays, Tanner Rourke in Buffalo in 2020. He had a two homer game to start his home run career in the big leagues. Well located fastball, one and two. Castle used his timeout. Slow things down a bit. Big crowd and a lot of noise here in the ballpark trying to help Garcia out of this. Got it. A big out for Jimmy Garcia. The Blue Jays need one to win it in the bottom of the ninth. It'll be Kiermaier, Springer, and Bichette. Telecast is presented by Authority of Rogers Blue Jays Baseball Partnership and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of Rogers Blue Jays Baseball Partnership. The bleacher section out just above the visiting bullpen where one Buck Martinez spent some time last night. Yeah and you know what those are real baseball fans and a lot of those fans they remember what it was like to sit in the bleachers at Exhibition Stadium and then there's a lot of younger fans as well that never went to Exhibition Stadium but it's a great vantage point right above the Orioles bullpen and here's 
the American League relief pitcher of the month for April. He is 11 for 14. This is not a save situation, but he's got 11 saves and 14 attempts, and he doesn't give up much, folks. A 160 opponent's batting average and 17.1 strikeouts per nine innings. New right fielder Ryan McKenna has taken over for Anthony Santander. And Kevin Kiermeyer leads it off. Swing and a miss. 0 and 1. Shortstop has it. The long throw. He's not in time. Good effort by Mateo, but Kiermeyer beats it out. Well, Mateo knew exactly what he had to do. He didn't have any time to plant his foot and fire across the diamond. He threw on the run and just couldn't get enough on the throw. Kiermeyer hits it in the hole. It's shortstop, and Mateo made a nice play, but Kiermeyer outruns it. Boy, what a terrific at bat to start the inning. Another hit for Kiermaier. So the winning run is at first with nobody out. And here's George Springer who is two for four today including a home run back in the fifth. Bautista. There goes Kiermaier. Springer taken all the way, and Kiermaier steals second. Five for five for Kiermaier. Picked his spot perfectly. Springer took it all the way. He saw the great jump at first base and didn't even offer at it. Watch Springer's reaction. Great jump at first. Springer says, Take it, my man. And he does. Strong throw by the catcher, just too good a jump at first. And 2 0 the count on Springer. And 3 0 the count on Springer. Well, walk off wins have been a thing on this homestand. Danny Jansen had a walk off single on Mother's Day and then a walk off home run on Wednesday. Big crowd better than 41 thousand here today hoping for another walk off victory this afternoon. Not close. Ball four. Didn't even throw him a fastball on three and oh so it's two on with nobody out for Bo Bichette. Heading to the mound for a conversation with Bautista. Here's our our young friend earlier who brought this sign to the game tonight, a cancer survivor. And he says, "Hey, Bo, I beat cancer. Can you beat the pitcher?" Bo would love nothing more. Bo has had two walk-off home runs. Won both of them actually against the Yankees, Tyler Lyons and Chad Green, his teammate now. Range with the Blue Jays rehabbing from Tommy John. But Bo would just as soon settle for a soft single to right. He's one for three in his career against Bautista. Runner out at second and Kiermaier. Vavra, the third baseman, in on the edge of the grass. And it's strike one. Yeah, I don't know why Vavra was there. Bo's not going to bunt. And now he backs up into a more traditional position. You like that Bo hits the ball to the opposite field so much, you a better chance to advance the runner, even if it's an out. 
Yeah. Oh, he handles the bat so well to that side of the field. And, and you're right. Even if he hits it on the ground, it's a tough ball to turn two on. And you know that Kimmerer is going to end up at third. Stairs, ball one. Bo has 31 opposite field hits, 11 more than Brandon Nimmo and Bryson Stock, the most in the majors. A look back, and the one two. And he got him. Bichette strikes out, one down. Some kind of off speed pitch. It might have been that hard slider. It's that fork ball, the split finger pitch, and boy, it has a lot of movement. Right over the top, same release point as his fastball. So now Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And he's popped it up into shallow right center. Mullins is in, and now there are two outs. Bautista gets a couple of very big outs against two of the very best the Blue Jays have. So now it is Alejandro Kirk up for the second time. Came up as a pinch hitter in the seventh and delivered an RBI single. Just a long, long look at Kiermeyer before he delivered the pitch, and nobody's even really pretending to try to keep Kiermeyer close out at second. A hundred, but high, a ball and a strike. Greg has two hits and three at bats against Bautista. They had a nice at bat against Cole Irwin as a pinch hitter in the seventh. And base hit to center field. That's that high splitter. He laid it off. Tell you, and maybe it's just part of his MO. He's spending like eight seconds every pitch just staring out of Kiermaier at second base. Yeah, I don't think he has any concern about Kiermaier yeah. running. I think it's just something he's doing to yeah. stay focused. Neither one of the infielders is moving yeah. from their defensive position. Three and one the count. And Kurt swung at what looked like ball four, so it's now full. This does, though, give Kiermaier a running start. Matt Chapman on deck if Kirk were to walk, say to load the bases. Tense moments here in the bottom of the ninth. There go the runners. And Kirk strikes out. So the first two reach but the Blue Jays cannot score and it's on to extra innings. They led now they're tied we're going to extra innings here between the Blue Jays and the Orioles just in the, another day in the American League East. Absolutely a lot of things going on and John Snyder went to Jordan Romano in the eighth inning with two on and two outs hopeful of getting out of that inning but Ryan O'Hearn had a three run home run to tie it up. Blue Jays had some opportunities. Kiermaier with a single, Springer with a walk, but Felix Bautista, as he's done all season long, comes up with some good pitches. Great fastball, great splitter, and you can see now there was the runner, Brian Mountcastle, who made the last out at the top of the ninth. He'll take his position at second base, and Adam Frazier is the batter. 
And Frazier's had a good day. He's got three hits today. And if you're the visiting team, you're not thinking about playing for one run here. You're thinking about getting as many as you can. But if you're Brandon Hyde, you do like the fact that Frazier is a very, very high contact hitter. And you can see the Blue Jays are in on the corners here. And he does square. And he pushes it to Chapman, who feeds Merrifield over at first. So a sacrifice to advance the runner. Yeah. Adam Frazier can do a lot of things to help you win ball games, And Mountcastle has advanced easily. Frazier, that's a textbook bunt. In that situation, you want the third baseman to field it, and he squares early and runs it perfectly. Right in front of Chapman, who has to leave his defensive position to third to make the play. And now the go ahead run is at third base, just 90 feet away. And the infield is in for the Blue Jays. The batter is Austin Hayes, 0 for 1. They play Hayes way around to the opposite field in the outfield. Springer is shallow in right and over towards the line. Kiermeyer well into right center, as you can see. Grounded to third. Chapman coming home and it hit the runner. And the run will score to give the Orioles the lead. Well that ball hit Matt Chapman into the baseline and he's got a tremendous arm and he threw a strike but unfortunately it hit Ryan Mountcastle in the back and Chapman makes a good play fielding the ball and it runs into the foul line and you can see Mountcastle sensed he was possibly going to get hit and he does and there's nothing that you can do about this it hits him squarely in the back and he's going to score the go ahead run. So the scoring is fielder's choice E5 fielder's choice for the runner to reach E5 for the runner at third to score and it is now 6 5 Orioles. And here's Ryan O'Hearn who's got the biggest hit of the game so far the three run home run off Jordan Romano in the eighth inning. Well, you talk about a bang bang play where you have to make a decision in the, in the blink of an eye down at third. Yeah, you try to make a good throw, and it, you just didn't have a chance to clear the baseline. He was throwing toward home, and it hit Mountcastle right in the middle of the back. And there's strike three. And remember, because of the rules, Danny Jansen can't set up in foul territory. You've got to give the runner coming home a lane, right? So. Chapman's in foul territory but by rule Danny Jansen's got to be in fair territory or, or they'll say he didn't give the runner a path to the plate. Right. And if you set up in foul territory that becomes a better target right. for Chapman at third. And that's something we could always do on a play like that. It's kind of like the first baseman calling for the ball from the catcher. Right. You stand on the inside of first base and had Danny Jansen had the opportunity he could hold his glove out to the foul territory at home plate and ask for the baseball on yeah. that side. But if he now by rule now if he's in foul territory they would say no lane and they would just award home plate to the runner. It's catchers are instructed you've got to line up in fair territory. Now look the runner is in fair territory right you kind of expect the runner to be in foul territory because he started there but he was in fair territory. And that's an interesting aspect too because there is no 45 foot running lane from third to home. Backhanded stop by Merrifield. He'll feed Guerrero and the Orioles are retired but they get a run and take a six to five lead to the bottom of the tenth. By Danny Jansen. On Mother's Day Danny Jansen Sunday had a base hit through the left side to knock in two. And turn a loss into a win with a base hit as Chapman slides in with the winning run. That's the first of two walk off hits for Danny Jansen. Then Wednesday against Wandy Peralta in the 10th inning, a three run home run to the seats, and the Blue Jays now have four walk off wins. And Danny Jansen has two of them on this homestand. He is due up second. The Orioles get a run in the top half and lead six to five. Matt Chapman will be the first batter. Kevin Biggio is running. It 
would have been Alejandro Kirk. He made the last out of the ninth inning. Biggio in as a pinch runner. Felix Bautista back on the mound for the Orioles. Swing and a miss, one and one. Boy, he just fastball after fastball at the top of the zone and mixing it with that splitter down below the knees. Tough combo. And the cat and mouse game between Bautista and Biggio. One and two on Chapman. Yeah, Bautista's got a terrific arm, and you know he's really turned into a terrific closer. They traded their closer last year mid-season to Minnesota, and then they handed the job to Bautista, and he has grabbed it. Bautista strikes him out, one down. Right over the top. I mean, that is as over the top as you can get. And he blows it by Matt Chapman. That's the third strikeout since coming into the game for Bautista. Now Jansen takes a fastball for a strike. Frazier a little bit closer to second trying to keep Biggio from getting too much of a lead. Oh and two. Yeah they're going to keep the ball up to Danny Jansen. The home run he hit off Baker was a low fastball and the home run he hit on Wednesday off Peralta was a low slider. Again, a long look back at the runner. And the 0-2. Way high. Bautista has never taken two looks at second in this game. He stares a long time at the runner, but once he turns his head, he comes home. And see if Bizio can pick up on this. And Maybe get a jump. And he's basically out of time, too, because he looks at him until the clock almost runs down. So he's got to come home. I think Kevin's picked up on it now because he hasn't gotten two looks at any point in this game. But is it too late in the at bat? Like you like to get there earlier so Jansen could bring him in on a fly ball or. Two and two the count on Jansen. Not going and a swing and a miss again. Ninety nine time and time again up in the zone. That's two down. That's interesting now as Brandon Hyde has come out of the dugout fastball upstairs and Jansen swings and misses and they've got some arms down in the bullpen. But they're going to leave it up to you Bautista and Perez. He was looked like he was coming into the game. He walked toward the stairs to come into the game. He thought maybe they're going to make a change, but why would you change? I'm wondering if this is just a reminder, and, and we see Dalton Varsho a lot. The issue for him is the high fastball. Maybe this is just a reminder to the pitcher and the catcher. Don't throw anything right. but high just heaters. Just keep throwing high fastballs. Just a guess? Pretty good guess. <laughs> Whoa, not that high. Show had a walk off 
winner for the Blue Jays April the 29th against Seattle at a single in the bottom of the 10th. And this is where and you talked about it before sometimes the best bet is just don't swing at it. like hope it's above the zone and yeah. maybe you get a walk and give Whit Merrifield a shot. Yeah. And you know what it, it looks hittable here. You know you're going to get something upstairs. Easy to say of course it's coming in at a hundred. So. That one down and it's fouled back two and two. Bautista strikes out the side in the bottom of the tenth and the Orioles tie it in the eighth get a run in the tenth and they have now handed the Blue Jays their fifth loss in the last six games Yeah, and they had an opportunity to close things out but Ryan O'Hearn hit a three run home run in the eighth and to tie it at five five and then they just couldn't come up with it and the Orioles manufactured a run in the top of the tenth inning and the Blue Jays couldn't get anything going with a guy at second base as Bautista struck out the side his 12th save of the season. So the Blue Jays will try to salvage the final game of the series and a five and five homestand if they could win tomorrow. Kevin Gosman will be on the mound. But time now to send you to the Budweiser studio with Jamie and Caleb.